All right, welcome back for the afternoon uh, ComStack session. Uh, we are continuing on with some AST updates. Uh, first will be an update on the loxmethane testing by Brian Rushforth. He is the manager of the innovation division here at the Commercial Space Transportation Office. So Brian, over to you. Thank you, sir. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we can get the presentation up. There we go. All right, so uh, I believe Randy Repchak. Wait till there we go. It's getting there. Uh, Randy Repchak briefed down on locks methane, but I understand there's a lot of new uh, members this year. So we're going to go through some of the background on the whys of locks methane and just give a very quick update of where we stand and a short uh, uh, update of of some stuff NASA and DOD is doing at a really high level. Uh, but uh, next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, so why LOX methane? What we have right now, uh, we're aware of five launch vehicles under significant development, if not obviously, you know, deployed and launched in one case or several cases rather. Um, you know, the uh, the established formulas um, for LOX methane uh, and and the current modeling doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist across the entire federal government. Uh, so that's why there's interest in, in from DOD and NASA as well. We just don't know uh, the yield of the explosive enough uh, from an FAA perspective. And so we are looking at, um, that's why we're uh, conducting experiments on using mass as well as impact speed for an intact impact uh, assessment. Next slide. Wylox methane, those those of you on there who are already doing LOX methane all know this, but you know if you have a higher specific impulse uh, with uh, with a similar amount of uh, propellant, more fuel stays in the launch vehicle um, and uh, burns cleaner. Um, so those are the big advantages of it, obviously. And next slide. And the challenge is that they're both miscable and makes it fairly explosive. So that is one of the, or more explosive potentially than others. So that's one of the reasons we're looking at doing this. And so we are working with, closely with NASA, Department of Defense, uh, and looking at a variety of different uh, R&D around LOX methane. Uh, so we can come up with uh, some explosive, from our end, explosive yield data from, uh, well, DOD and NASA, they're looking at other items such as, uh, you know, uh, site, uh, uh, you know, site uh, siting on federal ranges. And then a secondary thing for us is also fragmentation uh, debris, as well as uh, de dealing with uh, updating our, our MPL, the maximum probable loss. Uh, so next slide. So that's actually a picture of uh, the crane we have that is fully um, operational at Dugway Proving Grounds, Utah. It is 140 feet tall with 120 foot uh, transom across the top that uh, we'll be using to drop uh, a variety of different uh, size stainless steel barrels with uh, mixes of uh, liquid oxygen and methane in it. Uh, we have uh, right now, um, We've done a C4 test last week to calibrate the sensors around to measure the explosive yield. Uh, we will be conducting an inert drop test uh, using liquid nitrogen only uh, on uh, the last week of May is currently scheduled. And then come June, we'll actually start the first of, thank you, the first of the various uh, uh, locksmithing combinations that are ranging in size from 500 pound uh, pressurized and unpressurized to 20,000 pounds pressurized and unpressurized tanks. Um, so that's uh, it's going to be about three weeks uh, is the estimate from our contractor between each uh, each uh, session to gather data, refill the crater, 
uh, assess damage and uh, all that. Next slide. So phase two, we're gonna be looking at doing potentially next fiscal year, which is varying the impact velocity as opposed to a static velocity, a similar velocity with different masses is looking at um, increased velocity over mass uh, for phase two. We are going to, we're not gonna launch right into phase two. We're gonna be taking some time to uh, get a report for uh, what the items are. Uh, we are going to share the results. This is non-proprietary, um, you know, and so uh, this is federally funded. So all the results uh, that we can share will be shared uh, with it. Next slide. And then briefly, without getting into every detail of NASA, they, we are looking at, um, you know, they're looking at more from the ground safety side, uh, DOD and NASA, uh, for federal range requirements um, and uh, looking at how to reduce conservatism uh, in the future uh, and get more accurate risk assessments. Now, DOD and NASA are also starting uh, some discussions with launch operators, uh, various launch operators around what are the specific plans uh, and the specific R&D projects that, are, that they are planning on their end. Uh, and they're setting up meetings and have already had at least one meeting I'm, that I'm aware of as we speak. Um, we are working very closely with DOD and NASA, so we don't have any overlap uh, with them. We're not duplicating uh, fully. If anything, we're complementing uh, on stuff. So, for example, NASA is going to be using our tower um, after we get done with phase one for some additional tests on their own. And we'll be sharing, obviously, the data among ourselves with everyone as we uh, as we find more stuff out. So I believe that's actually it. Um, does anyone have any questions? General Mercer, sir. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate the report. I have a couple of couple of questions and then another thought. The first question is, who has the lead? You talked about this being a multi-agency effort, DOD is involved, NASA is involved, FAA is involved. Who's got the lead for this work? The lead for coordination is NASA with their NESC unit, uh, their NESC organization. Uh, we are we had already been planning to do for a couple of years um, our own experiments because it deals with our particular uh, standards and uh, regulations around the explosive yield, and uh, so we. There, there was no overlap from our perspective uh, when, when NASA, when we got a hold of NASA and, and DOD, and they were planning to do their stuff as well. We're just um, right now a little further along in terms of implementation, uh, but we work very, very closely. NASA has the lead to their NASC in terms of a giant overarching uh, project plan for each of the various experiments. Okay, so when your testing is is completed, and you have some T and T equivalency for mm -hmm. for for methane, how does that interface with the NASA work or the DoD work? Does that then become the gospel or no? Well, it complements and adds our uh, for our uh, regulations um, looking at. Uh, for the yield, it's going to be determining for hazard areas, uh, certainly outside of federal ranges. Uh, federal ranges themselves, um, you know, as you know, sir, have their own, you know, their own standards and and what they look at. Um, I don't believe ours becomes the gospel per se universally. I mean, there's other experiments that are going on around some basic uh, research on uh, the interaction of LOX and methane you know, different combinations. I know ours is, you know, ours is an intact impact test uh, that we're looking at in the explosive yields for around hazard areas and how much to do them and, and later on whether or not there's distance focused overpressure issues. Um, NASA and DOD are, more, are looking at uh, pre-launch explosions. So you have a full uh, fueled rocket on a, uh, um, 
on a uh, on a pad, what is the effect of that? What kind of safety areas do you need to have for on a federal range, uh, give, especially like the Cape, where you have multiple uh, pads all over with different tenants? Okay, so Brian, you see what I'm scratching at, right? You know, um, you know, who's got the? Who, clearly, nobody has the lead on it, right? Everybody's got their piece of it right now, but but nobody really has the lead on it. And from from a customer perspective, I, I, the, the reason I'm poking at it is because whatever is determined, right? Whatever that T and T equivalency is determined, is going to determine what the hazard arts look like for spaceports. You know that that's that that's how that determination will be made. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of sensitivity on uh, on that. Certainly for those of us that have to respond to that, you know whatever whatever is determined, you know we got to respond to that. Does that mean I got a hazard arcs now um, for a particular type of rocket? Now I got to go out another thousand feet. You know I mean it's just it, that, that's my concern. I just I wish somebody had the had the had the bow on them that had the lead for this that could that could walk through this. And then the, the final question I had was uh, time frame. You know, we, you talked about a phase one and a phase two. How much time is it going to be before we start seeing some result come out of that in terms of uh, the TNT equivalency? Well, we're going to have, so first of all, so within the U.S. government, uh, as Paul Wilde has pointed out, uh, the, the Common Standards Working Group is the, coordinates the standards for locksmithing within the United States government uh, and their items. Our stuff uh obviously you know the, for federal ranges there are slightly different or it can be slightly different regulations depending upon the needs of dod or nasa uh whereas we are basically everywhere else um we're looking at phase one uh results probably we're going to have something approximate i think by the end of the calendar year phase two is probably going to take um you know up to another up to another year after that and then uh, I believe NASA and DOD's plans for their various uh, experiments that they're doing, uh, those go out. Uh, they have, I believe, a year or two of internal uh, for, for their what I would call for their phase, initial phase of operations. And then they have some planned, uh, planned but currently are not fully funded uh, experiments uh, for two or three out years uh, after that. But that's still that's still in the planning stage. Okay, so so the question then then becomes, you know, uh, those companies, some of which you had listed on your slide, are talking about uh, launching with LOX methane in the next year and a half, two years. Uh, they they want to be getting off the ground, um, you know. So what? How are those standards going to be levied in the interim? Well, right now there's individual. So um, I believe SpaceX's um, Starship uh, is you know got off the ground with an FAA license. Uh, so we do work, uh, part of the issues of doing the LOX methane is right now, um, we, we don't have, um, we don't have a, a solid feel on the whole of how much of a TNT equivalent LOX methane is. So there is a bit of conservatism that we've introduced, um, uh, with, with that, with that particular thing. And so the hope is, is that when we validate this, um, if it is in fact, if we are being too conservative, then we're actually going to be um, lessening uh, the requirements. If we're spot on, then we have that we have confirmation that the standards are are adequate. Um, but we don't know that for sure yet. Okay, th thank you for that. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, any other questions for Brian? And our next will be uh, hearing from Dr. Paul Wild, the Senior Technical Specialist here within the Office of Operational Safety. Uh, and he'll be speaking on an introduction to the CSWG. And as he noted in the comments, CSWG will be the group that coordinates standards for LOX methane within the United States government. So uh, Dr. Wild, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. And John, would you bring up the slides, please? 
Thank you. Um, so it's an honor for me to represent a large group of very professional folks that uh, are dedicated to the Common Standards Working Group and the Senior Steering Group. I am the FAA Tri-Chair. Uh, next slide, please. So very quickly, we'll cover the CSWG in terms of its composition, uh, its who's who, uh, its purpose, its scope, and some select representative capabilities. Next slide, please. In terms of the composition, we have a senior steering group, which is made up of Mr. Coleman and Mr. Deloche and Major General Levitt. They're the most uh, senior safety officials in each of the main organizations, uh, <clears throat> being, of course, uh, the FAA, the NASA, and the Department of the Air Force. And the senior steering group essentially uh, directs and oversees all of the activities of the Common Standards Working Group, which is led by the three tri-chairs that you see there, myself, Sandy Hudson, and John Orpin from the Space Force. I believe they've joined us today. Uh, we have a secretariat um, that we're currently providing, uh, and Diane Duran, she does a really great job for us. You see some of the chartered representatives, of course, include uh, the major ranges where most commercial launches take place, as well as the Air Force Safety Center. We do have invited participants from other parts of the government. Um, the NRO is always um, active. And this is not an inclusive list. The tri-chairs um, can add additional agencies um, as necessary. And very importantly, one of the main points I wanted to make is while the CSWG is a US government forum, um, you know, there's opportunity for the industry to participate in the meetings. And certainly if you have any issues with the Common Standards Working Group, I encourage you to reach out uh, to the tri-chairs, uh, to reach out to me, paul.wild at faa.gov, and uh, let us know what's going on, and we'd be happy to talk to you and hopefully find a solution. Next slide, please. So the purpose, of course, is safety. Safety is our North Star, and the Common Standards Working Group was started almost 20 years ago, so I can imagine that that much time has passed. Um, but the concept, of course, is that if we can develop and maintain a stable framework of common safety standards and recommended practices, that that will provide economies of scale, or as Pam Underwood said earlier, uh, interoperability and transparency that's beneficial to the space transportation enterprise. So for example, to get to General Mercer's point, uh, the Common Standards Working Group is responsible to identify, here's the you know, LOX methane explosivity standards that we all believe should be used such that if you're doing a mission for the Air Force or for the NASA or a commercial mission, uh, it should be consistent across all those uh, different types of launches. So the Common Standards Working Group is intended to provide this timely and efficient coordination. Um, realize sometimes, a lot of times, industry works at a faster pace than we do in the government, but we do the best we can with the resources that we have. And um, when you look at it from the big picture perspective, we have, have been able to be uh, quite efficient, certainly when it came to uh, the Part 450 development. And the Common Standards Working Group played a big role in coordinating that across um, the various parts of the United States government. Extremely important, I want to point out these last two bullets, that uh, the Common Standards Working Group is exclusively an advisory body. So any actual authority, of course, uh, lies within the departments, um, and the agencies themselves as delegated by the Congress. And so we believe these are important common standards, recommended practices that should be uniformly applied for these missions that are conducted or overseen by the different agencies, unless directed by senior leadership. So of course, there's always um, the option 
in a particular case to depart from a common standard uh, if necessary as authorized by our senior leadership. And as you know, um, well, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, approval of waivers. The Common Standards Working Group has a role in that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the scope, I'm not gonna read this, but these are the formal definitions. So what is a common safety standard? What is a recommended practice? The common standards in a nutshell include, of course, what's in the Code of Federal Regulations, but also the means of compliance, which could be uh, notably our advisory circulars. We're continuing to work um, to produce more and more uh, advisory circulars, and those are reviewed and um, comments are given uh, by the Common Standards Working Group as part of that process. And in addition to that, of course, uh, the other agency, quote, regulations can often serve as uh, excellent means of compliance uh, because they tend to be more detailed. And of course, we want that concept of interoperability so we gain that there. Uh, recommended practices are exactly uh, what they sound like. Uh, they're just recommendations and um, <clears throat> uh, not considered a common standard. So um, next slide, please. And Paul, before you go on, I believe General Mercer has a question. So maybe he wants to jump in here before we get too far. Absolutely. Yeah, th thank you. General Mercer, yeah, thank you. Uh, great to see you. I remember the yeah, 12 mission. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a, that was a great one. Um, yeah, so, so thanks for this. The, I circle back though to something you said earlier about the common standards working group has kind of got the belly button pinned on them for this blocks methane safety discussion. But yet you just pointed out that they're an advisory body. Well, an advisory body as such can't require or direct. Um, so how then do you have the, the, you know, the belly button for the standards that will come out for the LOX methane. As an advisory body, you can advise, but you can't direct or enforce. So I'm puzzled now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I would say it's similar to the Range Commanders Council in that way. As you might recall, that's a, a framework where, you know, we have all the MRTFPs uh, and they get together and they discuss and they have experts that can identify, you know, we think this is the best way. We think these are good uh, risk acceptability criteria, something I was involved with a great deal, but they publish those in standards that are advisory. And then the, uh, the agencies and the ranges themselves are free to adopt those or not. So we're only as good uh, at achieving commonality as our standards are compelling in in their you know intellectual rigor. So um, if we do a good job, uh, the standards will be uh, used. And uh, as I uh, mentioned, you know when we have um, a advisory circular, for example, um, that is an accepted means of compliance for for an FAA launch. There's no guarantee that if you did the same thing, for example, for a NASA launch or a, a Space Force launch, that that would be determined to be good enough. Um, but these advisory circulars would have been reviewed uh, by the experts at, in those different agencies. And so um, there's, there's nobody saying thou shalt must abide by these standards, but my experience is when we do a good job, the standards are adopted. Did I answer your question, sir? Uh, yes, thank you. I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole. Thank you very much. Okay, appreciate it. So as you see here, um, this is uh, more about the, the scope and we really cover, of course, everything under the sun when it comes to the safety of launch and, and reentry operations. Um, distant focusing over pressure was a big deal for that Titan IV B-12 mission, as you recall. And uh, we continue to work on improvements there. 
as well as uh, under the assured access to space explosive safety that's on the ground side. I see deloxmethane. Um, nuclear safety, I know that uh, Karen Shenowork asked a question earlier about that. And indeed, we have a subgroup that's working towards uh, you know, reaching mutual understanding and developing uh, hopefully common standards for how those uh, nuclear safety issues will be resolved. Um, I'm not going to cover all these. They're, they're not necessarily permanent. Some of them do come and go. Uh, but this gives you a flavor of the work that's ongoing right now. Um, next slide, please. So this is our last slide. Um, in terms of capabilities, uh, I mentioned um, the work that was done for Part 450. That was an all-hands-on-deck effort for a number of years. And that rule um, got out in light speed um, by FAA standards, uh, taking only five years, as opposed to the previous really big rule that I worked on, which was uh, part 417 taking uh, 10 years. Um, another big capability the CSWG brings to the table is the effort for tailoring of safety standards, such as uh, the flight safety system standard uh, in RCC 319. So we do joint tailoring. <clears throat> uh, we also, of course, um, dig into new concepts and it tends to be a, uh, you know, a think tank for innovation uh, on these uh, various technical subjects. Uh, one of our prime goals, of course, has been to eliminate any duplication of safety uh, service approvals. Uh, so for example, we had some success there in 450 with um, the way that the ground safety now works for federal sites. We feel that we uh, achieved a, a, a good elimination of duplication of effort there. Not to say that we don't have any more work to do, but um, you know, I, I think the outright duplication is over and we're always seeking a balance between what the Columbia Accident Investigation Board called uh, redundant technical authorities in areas where you have you know, small margins or unknown margins that's a good thing. Um, so we want to make sure that we're all thinking together and bring together different perspectives, but no outright duplication. Uh, we've had uh, a number of MOUs developed and uh, requests for resolving re uh, the MOU for resolving requests for relief, waivers, or equivalent level of safety uh, is a good example. And we do monitor the trends there because we're sensitive to. Uh, the potential um, to drift towards a normalization of deviance. So we want to make sure that we at least annually look at those waivers and equivalent level of safety requests and uh, ask ourselves, is this telling us something? Is there a requirement here that's not a real requirement and that we need to update? So thank you very much. That's all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. John. Yeah, thanks, Jim. And uh, thanks for the, the uh, slides, Brian. Um, so this is a big deal. Um, you know, in the not too distant future, we're going to have three large rockets operate now, the Eastern range that are LOX methane. And it's, um, you know, clearly important that um, those operations happen safely. It's also important that we aren't overly conservative to the point that we impact each other's operations um, be because of keep out zones or explosive cones or whatever you like to call them. So I just want to make a comment that the, I think the urgency around coming up with appropriate standards that are safe but not overly conservative um, is, is there. And, and I'm wondering if, um, you know, certainly there is in data within industry that's come out of testing. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if it wouldn't make sense to somehow have industry participation in the CSWG as a, a matter of course, to provide that data, to provide the um, operational um, 
concerns or thoughts around that. <clears throat> and just to get a little more integrated around that so that we're focused on finding a solution that is enabling uh, industry to move forward. Yes, sir. I would say absolutely. We want to collaborate with the industry to the largest extent possible. Um, there is a, a, a current effort um, being led by the NESC to have increased engagement uh, with the industry on the locksmithing issue. Uh, I would say that as far as the CSWG goes, um, after uh, SpaceX conducted a series of tests, the CSWG did review those results, give comments. Um, so we have had an opportunity to uh, engage with industry uh, to that extent already. Okay, um, that's good. I guess I will reach out to you directly and, um, and have a conversation about getting more involved. Wonderful, thank you. This has now been a successful meeting from my perspective. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, any other questions for Dr. Wild? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the last uh, update from AST. And this is from Sabrina Jowad. Uh, she is a manager and she is over the space regulations and standards branch. Uh, and so I will turn it over to Sabrina to talk about the update on Spark 440, 460, rules, ACs, et cetera. So Sabrina. Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon. Um, so Calvin mentioned the two Sparks that we have kind of both going now and that we're anticipating coming down the pike. I just wanted to speak very briefly on um, what sparks are, just for some background for those of you who haven't participated before and may be anxious about um, joining the fray going forward. So a spark is an aerospace rulemaking committee and um, the FAA and um, DOT recently got the authority to um, charter aerospace rulemaking committees. Specifically, the secretary may do so under 49 USC section 106 P5. What's unique about this type of committee is that it is not subject to FACA. So it is more of an informal information gathering um, avenue that the FAA can take in anticipation of rulemaking or in gathering information about a particular topic. Um, so generally speaking, SPARKS will consist of a group of aviation or aerospace specialists, and they're selected to evaluate issues and provide advice and recommendations to the FAA. Um, Sparks have the opportunity to take advantage of industry technical expertise and experience, and we also have the opportunity to address any controversies in an open forum and to address issues prior to the beginning of a formal rulemaking process if the um, FAA determines that a rulemaking process will follow a Spark report. Um, finally, it broadens the ability for the public and industry to participate in the rulemaking process. So it gives kind of an additional avenue for the FAA to collect information. I would point out um, that SPARKs are invitation only. So the FAA kind of looks to the stakeholders that it thinks best are best suited to answer the sorts of questions the FAA has about a particular topic. That said, if you are not selected to participate in a SPARC, do not fear, because if um, the FAA does elect to pursue rulemaking after a SPARC recommendation report, you still have the full APA and notice and comment process during which you can provide um, input on any proposed rulemaking. The second point that I would make is that SPARCs and ARCs don't necessarily result in rulemaking or may not result in rulemaking immediately after um, a SPARC charter has expired or immediately after the FAA receives a recommendation report. Generally speaking, SPARCs will culminate in a recommendation from the members um, and the FAA will then take that recommendation report and decide based on the recommendations made what its next steps will be. So with that background, um, as Kelvin mentioned earlier, we have kicked off the 440 Spark with um, Jim Hatt and Karen Schenewerk as the industry and FAA co-chairs. Um, that Spark has started for two years, so March of 2025, um, and the report will be due on November 1st, so it has roughly a six-month period. 
Um, the Part 440 SPARC has been chartered to offer recommendations to the FAA on assumptions used to create the financial responsibility requirements and develop recommendations to update the regulations. Our second um, potential SPARC coming down the pike is our Part 460 SPARC. Um, that SPARC is also chartered for two years, so we're looking at the April 2025 timeframe, and that SPARC has a sort of a period of about a year before we would anticipate a recommendation report coming out of it, so roughly the end of April um, 2024. And for that SPARC, we are looking at, again, as Calvin mentioned, a new safety framework moving human occupant safety um, from informed consent to a performance-based regime. So that's where we are on Sparks. Just a brief update on the rulemakings that we have out there. Um, so I know somebody mentioned orbital debris earlier. Orbital debris is currently in the OIRA OMB review process. Um, so it is kind of going through um, OIRA review and interagency review, and the FA is adjudicating comments that we're receiving back on that proposed rulemaking. Um, the other rulemaking that we have in the unified agenda is the Commercial Space Launch Amendments, CSLCA, um, the latest uh, statutory update to Title 51 that, in, that implements um, the government astronaut definition, as well as makes some changes to the financial responsibility and cross waiver um, framework. And so that rulemaking, that proposed rulemaking is still within internal FA development and we're hoping to move that forward. That is a non-significant rulemaking, so that will not go through um, the OIRA review and the interagency review process. So those are our two rulemakings. And then we are also continuing to work uh, diligently on advisory circular circulars. We publish those um, as quickly as we can, particularly those that are related to PER 450. I think I've spoken before with many of you about um, providing input um, providing feedback. Those get published on our website and we can revise them fairly frequently if need be. So if there's any input or any revisions that you think are important, please do let us know. And then in addition, if there are any advisory circulars that you would like to see sooner rather than later, please also let us know about that because um, we can adjust kind of how we're prioritizing um, the advisory circulars that we're issuing. So that's all I have. Mike French. Yeah, thank you. Uh, quick question on the two rulemakings you just mentioned. Would both, obviously you have to go through the OIRA process and they could change, but is, uh, would those both come out, expected to be come out as NPRMs? Yes, so those are both proposed rules and um, the CSLCA rule that's implementing government astronaut actually won't go through the OIRA process because it's non-significant. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, Sabrina. Uh, Karina, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you very much for allowing us to update. Thanks, Jim. Yes, thanks so much to everyone from AST for joining um, and for being very flexible with us um, as we kind of had some discussion throughout the, the morning session. So really appreciate all those updates. It's actually really helpful to hear from you first before we go into these uh, working group discussions. So we can uh, go ahead, I think, and, and go right into the tasks. Um, just a couple of uh, sort of logistics and reminders for everybody uh, before we sort of dive in here. So just a reminder to everyone on the comm stack, and, and we can discuss this a little bit in a little bit more detail after the meeting today. Um, but we're all here with, um, with the comm stack, given our backgrounds and our expertise. And um, we need to make sure that whatever's happening at the working group level is happening with the members so that the members are engaged, the members can come back to the Comstack meeting, um, informed on the topics, informed on what the working group had been working on, and be able to speak to those issues um, from your own personal perspective. Um, we would really love to have a robust discussion on each item. I recognize that we have a uh, four o'clock end time tentatively here. We'll see how much we can get through today and, and what we'll need to do uh, as we get closer to the four o'clock hour. Um, on the voting process, I do think we are gonna be voting today on every task um, or at least every working group will have something to vote on. 
So just a reminder, we'll be doing a roll call vote for each of you, and we will ask you to vote yes, no, or abstain. My hope is that throughout the discussion, we will understand why we're going to get your no vote or your abstention, um, if that is how you choose to vote. If you're going to be absent for a period of time over the next two-ish hours, please put a note in the chat so we're not waiting for you to respond with your vote. Um, but we are hopeful y'all can remain on and, and uh, be able to vote here. Um, let's see, I think that's all I had for, uh, for logistics. Mike, is there anything I missed? Uh, no, Karina, thanks. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and go right into the tasks and hopefully we've got the afternoon slides pulled up here so we can review some of the text. The first two tasks are review essentially from the fall session. If you recall, we had a task to review FAA's draft report to Congress um, uh, on human spaceflight uh, safety framework. And then we'll also have the STEM task following this one uh, that Janice will brief. But I wanted to uh, go into this in a little bit more detail. So we've heard now from the ASTM uh, F-47 chair, Mike LA, we've heard from Rand. Um, I want to talk through a little bit of what we have kind of um, observed in some of our findings and recommendations for, um, from the Comstack on this effort. So um, if we can go to the next slide, I'll just go right into the background. I'm not going to read this to you word forward, but basically this is just talks about um, what the learning period is and why, um, why it was established. Um, as the gentleman from RAND mentioned, this is kind of unusual uh, to have this moratorium, but I think it's been absolutely critical to the success of the industry thus far. And I just want to also highlight here something that was mentioned during the RAND conversation, um, that uh, the secretary is allowed to write regulation um, if, there is an, if there is an incident um, involving death, serious injury, or unplanned event during the launch or reentry that posed a high risk uh, or caused a, a serious or fatal injury. So that's right in that, in that rule as well. Um, Congress has extended this twice now. It's currently set to expire October 1st. Um, and that's part of why we're here today. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so this just discusses FA's requirement to Congress. So the statute is written here um, in the center of the slide for y'all to read. Uh, or read at your convenience a little bit later on. But Comstack is tasked with responding to FAA's draft report to Congress, which was circulated several weeks ago. And a lot of you had some uh, comments on that report. We consolidated the best we could on those comments. Um, and I will go through some of the observations and findings. And then my hope is that we have a robust discussion on those observations and findings so that when we get to the recommendations, you can either tell me if you disagree with those recommendations, we can make changes to the recommendations so that we can be responsive to FA's requirement to Congress and uh, be able to close out this task here today. So go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so um, I'll, just, I'll talk sort of briefly to um, these uh, observations and pause for any comments or discussion after this. I've got three slides total, I think. The observations, findings, and recommendations, so it's not a huge amount of text, but I really want to get your comments out in the open um, if you all are willing to talk about it. So, um, commercial human spaceflight industry continues to grow in maturity and consistency. Uh, just a quick note again, the learning period was intended to not only allow time for the commercial human spaceflight industry to develop, but to allow both industry and the FA to gain experience on the challenges and opportunities associated with commercial human spaceflight. Um, this has been said multiple times, and I don't think it can be stressed enough, but most vehicle designs continue to be iterative and are very different from one another, which is one of the biggest challenges we have right now in the industry. Commercial human spaceflight missions are still infrequent and only one operational orbit human spaceflight provider um, and two suborbital providers have conducted commercial human spaceflight missions operations. And data on such missions remains limited and based on few and dissimilar vehicle designs. Uh, the second point here, the report characterizes the FAA and the industry as ready to implement a new safety framework. And just a, a quick sort of comment on that. The learning period allowed for continued iteration between these limited missions to ensure lessons learned in safety are able to be rapidly incorporated. 
Uh, the FAA has accrued limited data on such missions and needs further experience prior to advancing new frameworks. The FAA also continues to need time to evaluate and adapt its implementation of its existing performance-based observations uh, for uh, public for safety, uh, excuse me, framework for public safety. Uh, and then just another quick point here, a consistent regular cadence of diversified human spaceflight missions must be reached to ensure that any potential changes to the current safety framework is based on accurate data and supported by a strong regulatory infrastructure. Uh, the third point here, the report presumes that a new safety framework involves transition away from in informed consent. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop here and just remind folks what's currently regulated, what, it, what is informed consent for those who are not familiar with this topic. So the vehicles, uh, the, the launches themselves have to be licensed by the FAA. The FAA is tasked with uh, protecting the uninvolved public. Um, the thing that we're talking about today with the human spaceflight missions involve what's going on in, inside the vehicle itself. It has nothing to do with what's going on around the vehicle, the vehicle itself, um, or any, any involvement with the non-evolved public. All of that is already covered. We're only talking about the piece that has the humans inside. Um, so industry uh, currently operates commercial human spaceflight missions under a safety framework of informed consent for spaceflight participants and limited regulation relative to occupant safety, as well as public safety regulations associated with launch and reentry licensing, accident investigations, and other measures. So I'm gonna stop there in terms of the observations. What we tried to do is consolidate um, some overall observations within the white paper and have that discussion here before we get into the proposed recommendations. So I'd love to just pause and see if anyone has comments, feedback on this particular slide. All right, George. I'm not understanding the third bullet. I, I didn't see any discussion of informed consent going away in the report I saw. Okay, thanks, George. Any other comments? Joe? Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, tagging on to what George just said. Does the new safety, does it say anywhere that the new safety fram framework would necessarily preclude informed consent going on in the future? So I think that uh, a lot of folks assumed that the implication is by going directly into regulation that will do away with an informed consent regime. So I think that's the assumption that a lot of folks made. And Karina, yeah, on, on page 11, it says the transition from informed consent to a new safety framework will need to be done in phases, which doesn't state it directly, but certainly implies that informed consent will be left behind as, in favor of a new framework. Now, it doesn't preclude that informed consent is part of the new framework, but it, right. it, it right. tends to head that way. Right? Okay, thank you. Okay, if no other discussion here, I'm going to move on to the findings. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so overall, I would say um, just at a high level, the findings would be Comstack does not agree with the FAA's report as written. Um, obviously, as we know throughout the today's meeting that uh, we don't have consensus on this topic. Um, we don't necessarily need to have consensus on the topic. There are, there are some recommendations that I feel like um, are pretty easy to get consensus on. But it's, it's very clear that uh, commercial human spaceflight, human spaceflight stakeholders unanimously agree that a continued learning period is crucial to informing a, a framework for a robust and safe human spaceflight industry. That one uh, came through very clear with the folks that are directly impacted by this. Um, but I will note that some ComSec members prefer to transition toward regulation Although I haven't uh, um, heard anyone say that we need an immediate regulation. So um, uh, no one has, has directly said at the expiration of the learning period, October 1, we need to have regulation immediately. So if anyone uh, feels that way, I uh, encourage you to speak up here. Um, let's see. 
a couple of these other things. So the CompStack supports the ongoing development of industry consensus standards. Um, that one came through pretty clear. I would say that generally speaking, everyone supports this effort. Um, we heard earlier today from Mike L.A. on standards development. We learned a little bit more about the recent progress. I will absolutely agree that it was very slow in the beginning uh, because there was so much unknown. And I will say that these many years later, there is still so much unknown, which is why we struggle to answer this question um, for what it's worth. It's not because nobody wants to answer the question. It's because it's a difficult question to answer. So um, I don't, uh, I wanna just make a couple of other points about that. Something that came up during the RAND discussion uh, that I noted was, you know, he had mentioned that we can just write regulation and if it's bad regulation, we can undo it later. That is really hard to do. So it is critical that we get this right. And this is, this is the point that I feel like we won't need to keep stressing. It is important that the regulation is the right regulation for the industry. And the concern from a very, just a high level is that because the vehicles are so different, um, which by the way, that's, that's the primary reason that it's challenging to share information with each other. It's not because people are reluctant to share information, it's because it's irrelevant to the next company. Um, everybody has such a very different design, a very different vehicle. So there are a lot of challenges with that. But undoing um, regulation could be really bad for the industry. And there really is a safety um, implication there. If, the if we get the regulation wrong from the beginning, that absolutely could impact safety. So that's a huge point that I just wanna stress here and why I feel like it's important that we have, um, have this discussion. If people disagree with that perspective, I'd really like to understand what that disagreement is. <clears throat> Uh, and then, uh, let's see, the metrics and methodologies used by the FAA to determine readiness of the industry and the FAA to implement a new safety framework are unclear and require further substantiation. So the, the point here is that the draft um, provides a discussion on which, which indicators are used by the FAA to determine readiness of the agency, um, but the indicators are not necessarily associated with specific and measurable metrics. They are intended to act as guides to indicate when a framework should be established. So there are some kind of questions there about what's, what's really intended. I'll pause here, see if anyone has questions or anything they want to discuss here. Joe? Yeah, I feel like I'm always taking the floor here. Hey, um, this is just, just, just a question in terms of how you have those listed. Does it, does it make sense to put the last one first to give some context to the follow-ons? Or does it matter? Did you just put them up there without any, uh, you know, plan on how to lay them out? Yeah, I didn't really think too much uh, about the order, to be honest. Okay, because it seems to, you know, <clears throat> using that last one first seems to set the stage for the others. But okay, okay. that was the question. Thank you. Hey, Karina, it's Mike. So maybe just a little bit on that, right? Is when, and that's maybe one of my biases when I read this report and, and the RAND uh, report kind of had a similar trigger for me is I think a lot of us on this call have been involved our entire careers in human space flight and safety regulations and AST rulemaking and all of those things. Uh, but when you have independent reports or reports to Congress, right, um, it feels like a little bit of that background. And so that was one of my takeaways was this last bullet was it, it, it kind of, to me, gave a much stronger indication that industry is there and ready and we're ready to move forward as opposed to it's still really difficult to measure. We're not really sure. We're in a transition. We need a roadmap. And, and it's to me, it kind of oversold that we're ready. And I'm not sure that we, that's one of the reasons I don't think I agree with that report as written more for the tone it would take to the uninformed reader uh, who would be Congress, right? Uh, or others. So that was one of the points, which I think we're raising in the white paper as well is the, um, uh, the completeness of it, we, we need to make sure we we don't accidentally set too strong of a tone that comes back and bites uh, industry later from a readiness perspective. Thanks, Mike. Mike French? I just, uh, I want to follow any Mike with it within a comment, but uh, uh, that that's a really important, been a really important thing for me in this in this discussion as well for the last year or so is, as I see the statute, the industry readiness is a key is a key part of how the statute operates, and it was well constructed, I think, in requiring the series of reports, both from FAA and then from outside parties, to assess that question. Um, and so, for me, it was just disappointing to me that 
the, it, you know, if you go to the Rand report, it actually says that they that they could not do it, right? That they actually the conclusion of this section was um, that that they're not able to properly assess the question. And so that that to me again, I, I thought um, sort of key a key part of it, and and uh, whether to see that come out of AST to me would be really important because I think it's it it shows both the status on um, industry side, but also AST's assessment of industry is also very important. I think I think to the final question. Um, so just wanted to offer that comment. Yeah, thanks. That's very helpful. Any other discussion with this so far? If not, we can go into the recommendations and I don't really, other than the text themselves, I don't really have any background that I want to provide. I just want to talk through, you know, these are the recommendations that I think we have agreement on. Um, if there's opportunity to make changes to them, if folks have concerns about them, uh, please let me know. I will say that we, I thought we were there with the white paper, um, but late last week we had some uh, concerns uh, within the white paper, so it's not there quite yet. So what I want to do is work through the recommendations today, and then we'll kind of work backwards from there. So once we get the recommendations agreed upon, then we can go back into the paper and, and uh, complete the actual write-up. But I took notes of some of your feedback. I really appreciate that. So we can go to the next slide. So again, you know, the task was to respond to um, FA's draft. So these recommendations essentially um, are, are an attempt to do that. So number one, the FA should detail how it analyzes the readiness indicators outlined in the report and provide a more thorough substantiation of the agency's findings regarding the industry's readiness to implement. I think that, that one's coming through loud and clear from you all. The second, um, FA should continue to encourage current efforts to develop industry consensus standards through the devotion of resources and incentives for operators to participate. I think uh, there's, there's general consensus on that. I continue hearing that from folks. Uh, FA should prioritize updating the 2014 recommended practices for human spaceflight occupant safety document, including ComStack review prior to taking further action. And then the fourth one here, if a human spaceflight SPARC is chartered, the FAA should continue collaboration with Comstack and industry partners to determine the SPARC's scope, participants, and pace. Any discussion, disagreement on these recommendations? All right, Karina Dries, Ted here. Uh, no, no disagreement, but can you clarify a little more, expand a little more on, on the third bullet there? So that is something, uh, particularly for the safety working group, would really help be helpful to them to identify how to uh, discuss these um, human spaceflight related tasks. The recommended practices document, which by now I think everyone agrees is pretty outdated, um, is going to be helpful to identify how we talk through uh, future regulation how, or potential regulation, but more uh, timely, how we talk through the standards process. So I do know, um, I don't know if Jim uh, stepped, off, stepped away for a moment, but I do know that FAA is working on this and I believe is due sometime this summer. Uh, we, should we should be able to see an update to this soon. That is correct. Okay. Does, does this mean though they're looking at, at new standards? So it's meant to essentially guide the standards process and guide industry on what the FAA is seeing as sort of the most critical pieces to discuss and start um, thinking about for current standards development or potentially future regulation. So what are, what are the key topics today that AST has concerned about? Okay, all right, thank you. And, and Karina, uh, Joe here, when you say outdated, right? Yeah, I have it right here. I've been looking at the report while we've been going on today. Um, just refreshing my memory again. Uh, ha have most of the things like just been already OBE, like sort of overcome by events? They've, they've been implemented anyway. They don't make sense. Or, or, or are we complying, generally speaking, you know, at some percentile or, or you know, when you say outdated, what, what do you mean? So um, 
I'm going to also ask Mike if he wants to chime in here because he has got a lot of opinions about this. But basically, like the, the current recommended practices are not uh, really substantive enough for really for us to sit down and write a lot of these standards behind. So uh, the challenges that we're having with this is it, it needs to be a little bit more robust and a little bit more concrete for um, industry to really understand what's driving a lot of this at AST. Karen? Thank you. Yeah, Karina, I think I just, just on that one, I'd, I'd agree with you, right? It, uh, it's not that they're obsolete or out of date. It's that it was written back in, in 2014 when um, uh, there was only you know a, a small group of people that were trying to do this. Uh, and it was more notional and aspirational. And I think there's a lot more data that could be added to exactly that. It, it, is, a, it is the closest thing that can grow into a roadmap for standards and uh, and potential rulemaking on human spaceflight. So that's why it should get a lot of attention this year. Thanks, Mike. Karen, sorry, I assumed you wanted to uh, chime yeah. in on the topic. I, I, but I wanted to defer to Mike um, since he's been leading this effort. So um, yeah, I, I agree. And it's, it's a document that um, members of industry have provided comments and feedback to. Um, and I think there's there actually is a decent amount of now practice and experience um, in the sense of decent, like more than like $2 is more than $1 kind of way. Um, so um, in that, in that, you know, the flights that have occurred that have been FAA licensed and um, reflecting on the 2014 recommended practices for human spaceflight occupant safety document, you know, there are some places there where we've learned that it, it, it was written in a way that is kind of just misaligned with where industry has gone or practice has gone. Um, and, you know, there are things like the expectation that anybody who is crew is, you know, in the spacecraft, whereas, you know, in many instances, crew are on the ground in a mission control center. That uh, Pete, that's, uh, or Joe, that's a, an example for you of where, you know, it just doesn't quite fit with what's happened um, to date. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly agree with that, Kara, right? Just, uh, it, was, uh, it, it wasn't it was influenced by us, but back in 2014, Virgin Galactic was the group and we were piloted. So it kind of, you see the bias in there from that, right? Right. Thanks, everyone. Let's see. Um, any other discussion from folks here on the call? Thanks, Jim. If not, um, you know, we can certainly move to vote on this if y'all are feel you're comfortable with these recommendations. And then we'll um, I will really make an effort to get that white paper to FAA um, by next week so we can close this out um, and provide that feedback to them. Does anyone want to make a motion? In a second, Great. vote on this. Can I ask you just a question before we go to a vote here. So with regard to the recommendations you have, it's pretty different from text I've the draft text I've seen previously in a white paper. So how are you proposing that the white paper be amended to include only these recommendations? I mean the 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 devils and the details, right, of the actual document itself. And we haven't seen a new draft. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. So the, the comments that we got late last week, it was just too late for us to be able to circulate and try to get any kind of consensus on that. So the way we treated the original draft document, instead of saying, you know, the ComStack believes this, we structured it as observations. So what we'll do is if we have these recommendations that we can vote on today, we can essentially revise the white paper to, um, to reflect those observations based on what we're putting forth as recommendations. So we tried to gather as much input as we could from folks on what those observations were in the report. We started to run into some challenges toward the end where um, the, some of the text of the observations was just contradicting each other. So we couldn't really say, observation one and observation two, because they're contradicting each other. So um, we'll, what that means is we're gonna have to scale that white paper down substantially and really focus on what these recommendations are and why. So we'll write the text around these recommendations versus having uh, what we thought was the consensus position from the group. Joe? I'm sorry, everybody. I, you know, it's a Monday, not a Friday, I know. So we're going to try to keep this going. Um, could you just go back to that other page that you just sat on? 
I just wanted to ask a question about uh, a sentence there, because, you know, you know, what gets me here is and I agree with you totally on where the FAA is on this, um, you know, everything in my world in terms of any kind of best practice or for that matter, regulation has been born out of uh, some type of data, right? It was either obtained forensically, right, after something uh, bad happened, or it was uh, thankfully ever since Asias and uh, the Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Share Program, very dynamic uh, data collection effort through a preemptive, right? A, a, a pre, you know, being able to preempt anything bad happening because you see the risk. We have none of that. Right. And, and there doesn't seem to be a framework really for it. So the, if the expectation of just throwing this hot potato at us and saying, OK, stop making suggestions. Right. I agree with you uh, that not getting that right uh, could be damaging as, you know, uh, doing some not doing anything at all. So which we seem to have a pretty good record right now. So um, I was wondering about that sentence that says, uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, uh, it's the second paragraph. Um, and I wanted to know if that's what you meant by it. Uh, the standards through the devotion of resources and incentives, the word incentives, is that is, is kind of that where you're going on that in terms of being able to create the types of incentives where people would want to voluntarily offer up data and basically analyze it? So um, it's really meant to be more just encouragement, I guess, for operators to participate. So if if folks believe that the uh, the standards effort is helpful to the FAA, then right. I feel like more people will participate in the process. And, and I think that's where we are now. So we have um, AST up until very recently was not at all involved in the standards effort. Now that they're involved, it helps to get other folks involved in that uh, in that process as well. So now now that the standards I, the standards process is more inclusive, I would say. A lot of the folks that are participating today weren't necessarily there a year ago, largely because the FAA is now participating in the effort. Right. So that's the incentive. It, it, the, that's how we incentivize the operators to get more involved in the discussions. That's that's my personal perspective on that. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. And for uh, folks, you'll see a very aligned recommendation in the safety working group report to yeah. that same thing. John? Yeah, yeah, Karina, thanks. I just want to make sure I understood the answer to the question that Ann asked. Well, so these will be summarized in a skinny down white paper. Will the Comstack members have an opportunity to review and comment on that white paper? 100%. Yeah, we'll, we'll get whatever. I, I heard you say that. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I was hoping we could have the final product today that we could deliver to FAA. Uh, but it's clear that we need more time on the actual document. So um, we've done that in the past with Comstack, so it's not that unusual. If we can agree on the general recommendations, then we can go back and make some revisions to the actual white paper. Uh, we did that in the previous Comstack on a number of topics. So that's that's not really out of the norm, just for what that's worth. Thank you. Mike? I think this is going too easily for you, Karina, so I want to, I want to cause trouble. Um, uh, we heard so much today from uh, from the licensing folks, uh, methane testing folks. Just resources has been a discussion throughout here. Um, yeah, I, I, I sort of, I, I don't know the proper process for this, and maybe I should in my role as vice chair. Um, but but wanted to offer a, a, an amendment or an addition to these recommendations of some language along the lines of um, you know any activity in this area you know should consider existing res you know, existing resource constraints across you know, current licensing and other current statutory duties. I think it's just important to, to, to say something about the overall resources, given that there's, we, we heard about it, an already impact to licensing. Okay. That's helpful. Uh, let's see. Ganesh? Um, I'm not able to see the uh, on the final slide. Uh, I think the the last bullet, which was about, um, if you have the the last bullet there, I, I think one question uh, on the spark. We heard this morning about the status of the two sparks. I just want to make sure if there's anything in this last bullet that needs to 
change uh, on on that given what we heard this morning. Um, uh, but if not, uh, then then that looks fine with me. But I just want to flag that. I might let Jim answer that question. So Jim, um, is it official? I haven't seen anything come out. I'm sorry, I was I was looking at a question. I didn't get that question because you have multiple questions coming in from the public as well. Oh, sorry. So, so the question, yeah, the question is on the human spaceflight spark. So our recommendation is phrased as if a human spaceflight spark is chartered, blah, blah, blah. So I think the question that Ganesh is asking is we heard today that the spark has been chartered. So should we revise the language to this bullet? Uh, I would recommend yes, because it has been chartered. Yeah. So we can revise the language um, and just say the FA should continue collaboration. And then Karina, if I could just jump in, uh, there are several questions that have come in uh, that, may, that may play with this. Uh, any input from non-American space agencies is one question. And the other one uh, is, does anyone know how many human space flight flights are planned for 2024 and 2025? Does that influence when the learning period should end? I wanted to get those questions to you so you saw them and, and however you want to deal with them. Thank you. Okay. I, I might have to defer to one of the other members if they want to talk to their uh, flight plans for the next couple of years, but I can give sort of a high level answer to that. Um, whether it should, whether it's going to involve non-American uh, companies, I don't think so because it's this, we're talking about companies that are licensed by the FAA. So that would be, as far as I know, U.S.-based companies only. Um, what's the cadence looking like for 2024, 2025? I don't have a number, but I guess my answer would be like it's still not enough to know, you know, what our regulation should look like because we're still going back and iterating um, on those vehicles so that we can continue making those, uh, those safety improvements to the vehicles. So whether there's, you know, um, 10 launches or hundred launches, it's, it may still not be enough data. We'll know once we have a little bit more data and once we make more progress on the standards effort, when, at what point does it make sense to transition into that regulatory environment? That's that's my perspective. I'm sure other folks have a perspective on that. And, and just to, to clarify the question for you, it was not uh, non-American companies. Yeah. It was any input from non-American space agencies. I haven't seen anything. I don't know if other folks have. Let's see, Karina, uh, I mean, this really takes us far afield, so maybe it's not worth exploring right now, but um, it goes back to the, I haven't seen any input from other space agencies or regulatory authorities international, but back to the the dual mandate for AST with Promote, right, we've seen great efforts led by AST to help carry the U.S. regulations overseas, such that when we want to go operate there, right, we know we're in that same framework, there's not an extra burden of additional regs. That's been a fantastic effort by FAA and AST. I know that's not specifically what the question was asking, but it is probably a good chance just to highlight that while we're talking. I think the, the RAND report, you know, to get back on a personal note, right, there was a comment in there that said the dual mandate was what was prohibiting uh, rulemaking. And I, I totally disagree, right? The dual mandate for the FAA and promotion is all about helping us uh, as, as, an, as an industry and as a government uh, and as a, at a U.S. economy, uh, be able to flourish overseas. Yeah, totally agree. Um, George? Yes, just following up, uh, Mike French <clears throat> had a comment about resources, which I think is great. Uh, there's another way to, to look at that and, and frame it, though. Rather than saying um, before uh, doing anything, uh, we need to keep in mind the limited resources, an alternative way to say that is given all the current activity and the need to put uh, people on this new effort, uh, AST is going to require additional resources. So I flip it over and be a positive instead of a negative in terms of um, input to the, the secretary and to the Hill. Okay, thanks George. Karen? Yeah, so uh, one note is um, just a, a, a applause shout out to SpaceX and Axiom, right? There's a mission flying at the end of 
this week or targeted for the end of this week to launch with international um, uh, space flight participants on board. And that's indicative to me of, you know, a sign that there are at least are a few countries that are not concerned. And there have been other international partners involved in human space flight um, with commercial li licensed capabilities. <clears throat> so, so far, there does not seem to be a, a concern, for example, that, um, you know, there is a regulatory gap that, that is uncomfortable for international um, folks to fly on American licensed vehicles. So all it's kind of in the scheme of international, I'm not sure that's what the question is targeted at, but I think that's an important point. Um, and then the second one, uh, this is a follow-up on, on the resources piece as well, is that um, to the extent that there are limited resources and the limitation on resources are uh, causing timing challenges and delays with licensing launch vehicles, humans don't fly if the launch vehicle isn't licensed. So if we're trying to prioritize the use of resources for making sure that we can, you know, process and uh, address like issues at, at the FAA um, AST, I would advocate for the idea that solving the throughput of launch licensing and reentry licensing um, would be a valuable priority if you really can only operate in series or you have limited resources because nobody, no people can fly unless the vehicle is licensed. They can't go up and they can't come back down if there's a reentry involved. So I'll just note that in the scheme of the right licenses, the, the resource question. <clears throat> um, so yeah, those were the two things I wanted to add to this conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, that's really helpful perspective. I really appreciate it. Any other comments or discussion? Sounds like we've got some modifications to make to the recommendations. Um, so I'm not sure <laughs> how to handle the voting process unless we can make those uh, changes in real time, I suppose. Do we have a way to do that? Can we pull up the slides and have somebody assist with um, doing some quick edits or just add something in the chat that is the language that would be added that we would then see as the final? Yeah, that would be helpful. Mike, would you uh, be willing to type something up with your suggestion incorporating George's um, comments? And then I think on the last bullet, um, if we if we simply take out if an HSF spark is chartered, if we take that out, then we keep the rest of it in there and say the FA should continue collaboration with Comstack and industry partners uh, to determine spark scope, participants, and pace. If everyone's in agreement with that, I think everything else from what I heard is is okay. I'll, I'll do a poor job of what you just asked. Yeah, so Therese, that's a good point. Let's add uh, HSF in front of Spark in that last bullet, John, if you can do that. I assume John's typing, I don't really know, is it John or Leslie? And then uh, if you're able to paste Mike's um, comment in the chat into that recommendation slide so we can all read that text and see what needs to be modified would be really helpful. Okay, so it's there for everyone to read through.
Do we comment? need the first should in that question? Because we know activity is going to be required. Or excuse me, the second should. So many shoulds in there. Yeah, I mean, so I don't have pride of ownership. I just will explain what I was doing is I, I was trying not to be presumptive of the Congress and whatever the Congress is, is going to do this year. Yes, but we know that increased activity in this area is happening, right? So AST should seek additional funding as increased activity in this area, which impacts the necessary resources. I, I guess I guess my, my perspective would be at the moment that would only would be I, I support of the spark and and perhaps the the rewriting of yeah I, I I'll, I'll 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 no whatever we however it sounds better I was just trying not to I was trying not to presume um a sort of a full regulatory load so that 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 was all I was trying to get out and if 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 that if if those changes do that all good. Karina, this is John. Should I make the updates or are you guys still discussing? I think we're kind of still discussing. If anyone has recommendations, I mean, I feel like um, everything after, so uh, it should not impact the resources necessary to support and improve the current and expected increase in launch and reentry licensing activity and other current statutory duties in the office. I, th I think that should stay because I think that's where we, I, I believe anyway, agreed um, as long as any new activities don't impact the current sort of cadence of what AST is working on. So it's really that first section, AST should seek additional funding, should activity be required in this area? Um, do we wanna change that to just be more direct that should Congress determine uh, AST focus on additional efforts, they should seek additional funding or something along those lines. I might, suggest, I, I might suggest saying less about Congress and the additional activities rather than, or the activities required in this area rather than more. Um, even if there are significant resource constraints there, it is possible that they will find or could find ways to manage their different authority, uh, their different um, priorities and authorities. It's a standard problem that agencies have to deal with. Is how they're going to allocate their resources. So I think there there's probably a value here to saying a that they should seek additional funding as a general matter because of the resource constraints they mentioned uh, this morning, uh, and b that they should um, continue to support and improve launch uh, and, li and uh, re-entry licensing activities uh, given the expected increases uh, without any without any detriment to those activities. Um, and we could just have both of those pieces in there, uh, but without specifying if, if they wanna prefer one kind of regulation to another in different areas of, of FAA's operations, um, you know, or, or detail people from other parts of, of the department, uh, that would certainly be up to them. Just a, just a quick comment. Uh, you know, I think I think you're trying to fold way too much into a recommendation. I really do. And, and by doing it, you're confusing it. Yeah, and that was I, Matt's I, suggestion in the, in the chat as well. We should split it into two separate recommendations. Um, if we, uh, John, if you're able to do that, that might help folks to just kind of see what we're talking about here. So Matt um, put something in the chat just a minute ago. Uh, as two separate recommendations, and that might be a little bit more clear.
Thanks for your patience, everybody, as we try to uh, wrap this up and, and close this one out. Yeah, Karen, I, I like uh, actually the way you stated it. Um, maybe if we got rid of that, uh, the second should and just say in a limited resource environment, FAST should ensure that activities in this area not negatively impact, not negatively, I don't know, um, AST's ability to manage the current and expected increase in launch and reentry licensing activities and other current statutory duties at the office. It's definitely more comprehensive if folks don't uh, necessarily disagree with that. If you if you guys are missing this, it's all in the chat. So pull, uh, pull up the chat because a lot of the text is coming through there. Okay, yeah, let's read, read through that and and see if you guys have any objections to this, these last two bullets, really the last three bullets that have been changed. Okay. I'm definitely happy to take a vote on this if when if and when folks are comfortable with the language. And John, thanks so much for keeping up with all of this in real time. I really appreciate that. Julie, did we make that uh, change? I, I may have missed it if we've already taken it out. Yes, you did. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Janice, thanks, good point. We've got the FAA everywhere except the last two bullets. John, if you could just add the uh, before FAA just for consistency on the slide, that would be helpful. Okay. You can, you can delete AST from the last bullet to be consistent as well. Okay. Yeah, I would just say FAA's ability. There you go. It looks like we have um, a motion and a second on the recommendations. If we're ready for a roll call vote, I'm happy to call for a vote, but definitely want to pause for any final discussion here. And uh, just to reiterate uh, John's question earlier, will the white paper be circulated again? Absolutely, like we will get buy-in from everybody on the white paper um, based on these recommendations that we're voting on today. Okay, if no other discussion, I think we can call for a vote. Mike, do you wanna do a roll call vote? Yeah, what I'm going to do is, I mean, I, I think the thing I'll do is go through just the the full ComSec list. I know some people are not present, um, but but I think that might be the cleanest way to do this. So I don't miss someone on the Zoom. Does that work, Karina? Perfect. Yeah, that'd be great. So 
Uh, Karen Shenowark uh, made the motion. Matt Dunn seconded the motion. I'm just going to go in alphabetical here. Uh, General Bolton. I'm on board. Uh, Corinne Dries. I vote yes. Uh, John Elbin. Yes. Uh, I vote yes. Uh, Therese Jones. Yes. Kate Cromwell. Yes. Megan Mitchell. Yes. Uh, David Newman. I don't think I saw Dave. Uh, uh, Michelle Parker. Oh, here. Karen uh, moved. Uh, Ganesh Sitaraman. Yes. Uh, Sita Santi. Uh, Captain DePete. As a Marine, can I say aye? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Either. I'll, this is only one vote, though. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, Matt moved. So it's a yes. Uh, uh, Tony Frigo. I'm a yes. Uh, Mariba Ja. Dale Ketchum. Yeah. Uh, General Mercer. Yes. Uh, Mike Moses. Yes. Uh, George Neal. Yes. Uh, Melanie Fraser. Yes. Amanda Simpson. Yes. Jay Skylos. Yes. Uh, Janice Starzik. Yes. Noli Strickland? Yes. Ann Zolkowski? Yes. Julie Zoller? Yes. All right, the, the yeses have it, uh, Karina. Thank you so much, Mike, I appreciate that. Thanks everybody. And again, I really appreciate all of your um, effort in real time here as we uh, work to close this out. So we'll get on that white paper and hopefully get that circulated in the next day or two. Um, I think we're moving on to the STEM task. If that's the next one here in line and Janice is gonna brief that. And I think we're ready to take a vote on those as well. Okay, can we have the slides up on that one as well? Okay, the next one, please. So the regulatory working group worked on the STEM task, which was a follow on from the STEM working group that presented in December. Um, we had the opportunity to get uh, further input from the regulatory committee, all ComSec members, and then partner government industry organizations to strengthen these recommendations. Uh, the question itself, how can FAA partner with industry to increase and encourage greater diversity and participation in STEM education, supporting the growing need in the commercial space workforce? Uh, we do have a white paper as well that's been uh, circulated throughout uh, ComStack and will be submitted to the FAA as well. If we can go to the next slide. The recommendations have been um, categorized into uh, partnerships with different organizations. So there's actually more than three, but we have it listed here as one, two, and three. Um, to encourage greater diversity and participation in STEM education uh, in the first place, the ComStack Working Group recommends uh, developing uh, recommendations to work with the, the National Space Council and its member agencies. Um, now, National Space Council has been doing a tremendous amount of work in this area. Uh, some um, announcements were, were made in September of last year on, um, on different efforts that they are making across the, the Space Council, Council agencies. And there was some concern among ComStack members that this would become duplicative between um, different, uh, different parts of government uh, doing things uh, that would uh, be uh, pretty much the same, but create a, a second level of work for industry partners. Um, and would also uh, reduce the ability to focus on that. So um, in order to work more closely with the Space Council and its member agencies, uh, the first recommendation is to ensure harmonization between the uh, Department of Transportation STEM workforce efforts at the White House-led Space Industry Skilled Workforce Coalition. Um, FAA did work closely with uh, the National Space Council on this, and uh, there were um, 
specific things that the Department of, of Transportation uh, was assigned to do. Um, we are recommending that the, the FAA should work closely with the National Space Council staff, NASA, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, Department of Education to identify workforce needs and develop job training programs to fill gaps in these areas and promote lesser known career paths in the industry from trades to non-technical areas. Uh, the second is to create a space workforce messaging portal uh, and newsletter to notify STEM workforce partners of opportunities um, by providing a centralized location or newsletters for teachers, students, young professionals, et cetera, to learn about space apprenticeships, internships, scholarships, and other opportunities. Um, we'll basically be finding uh, one simple place that will actually uh, address several of the recommendations that we have in this uh, deck here. The last one here, the FAA should work with National Space Council and academic partners to increase their participation from these communities at space conf conferences and workshops. Um, so these are the, the recommendations that are associated with the National Space Council partners and staff. We can move on to the next page. The second set of recommendations is about how the FAA can work with industry. Um, Excuse me. So we have the following recommendations. Uh, DOT and FAA took part in the development of the interagency roadmap to support space-related STEM education and workforce. The three areas that I mentioned that the uh, FAA and DOT were identified as uh, areas of work were the following. Increase awareness of the breadth of space-related careers, provide a coordinated set of resources for educators, support STEM educator professional development. So we believe that the, the FAA should work to make sure that there is industry inputs into their three tasks here, um, and that we can make sure that that is um, uh, takes into account the, the industry input for all of, all of these uh, particular tasks. Um, just, uh, sorry. I, I just had a, a, a quick question, but I'll, I'll wait till you get to the last one there. Okay. So, uh, just basically in that first one, we're, we're asking for a way for that the FAA can become the aggregator and coordinator for these through the, um, opportunities that exist with the industry organizations. It's just a way to efficiently facilitate, um, the, the process of doing so. So by industry providing them the inputs, it will facilitate and make more efficient their um, process of becoming that aggregator. In coordination with, uh, for the second one here, in coordination with the, the Space Council organizations, the FAA should work to develop uh, an executive level workforce development office or officers to build strong local and regional STEM pipelines, including developing regional post-secondary STEM internship programs. Um, this would be essentially uh, for this and several other recommendations, we've identified in our white paper um, several models that could be used and adapted by the FAA for these recommendations. Um, this one in particular has several of them uh, listed. The third one here, which uh, I understand, General Mercer, why you'd be most interested, is focusing on the FAA licensed spaceports as providing a, a unique opportunity to create regional education hubs and provide hands-on experience for students of all levels. The aerospace business hub model that's been used by a lot of the spaceports uh, really lends itself to the, this recommendation and being able to, to um, support uh, and promote space industry activities with through these uh, the licensed spaceports. Do you have a question on that? Yeah, so, so I, I was thinking about just some of the wording on it. You know, you start off by saying utilize spaceports, um, by my way of thinking, you, you want to to uh, to designate spaceports, designate and then use spaceports, uh, because right now there's no designation of them being regional education hubs, and uh, and that would go a long way in moving this recommendation forward. And uh, and this this was a notion that uh, that that we submitted to to the group, so I'm all on board with it, but I think that. That you want to designate and use spaceports as regional education hubs. Designate them as a regional education hubs. 
I support that. Um, is there any concern with that among the group? John, can I ask you to edit the text on the slide? Well, I, I was going to ask, I mean, isn't that a significant change in the authority that the, the AST has right now um, in terms of effectively forcing spaceports to serve as these regional education hubs? I don't know that any of them would have a problem with it, but I think it's a very different question of do you designate them versus do you work with them um, to develop regional education hubs? Allowing designation versus designating. Yes. Does that solve the problem? It's fine with me. General Mercer. Yeah, that 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 works. I, you know, I, it, the bottom line is if you want to put any kind of a teeth in a recommendation, you gotta you gotta give it some some credibility, right? Other than just, hey, it's a nice to have. You guys go and if you feel like it, go do it. You know, recommend that they do it, right? And I'm okay with the adjustment that you made in terms of what was it, designation versus designator, you know, but but I think that action puts an action to that recommendation. Okay. And can you add of FAA licensed spaceports there? Yes, that's correct. That's important as well. And just to be a pain, it should be hyphenated. Okay, thank you. This is a big one. Um, there is some more text in the white paper on that as well, but um, I do believe this provides a, a easy outlet for um, some of the programs and a way to organize them. We're ready to move on to the third page. Okay, and the third is, is how we interact with high schools, universities, student organizations. So the recommendation is to highlight space industry jobs available and identify academic and extracurric extracurricular points of engagement with the FAA. Um, this, uh, I think, also goes well in hand with some of the other recommendations of providing an aggregation of these um, opportunities. And this is input from both uh, industry, but also universities, and then output to them as well. Um, so for this one, we would be, uh, on the last one, utilize and extend the Department of Labor's Space Focus Apprenticeship Accelerator to promote research areas and support the industry workforce pipeline. So the first half, the pipeline should emphasize the employment of historically excluded communities. We've also referenced the, universe, the US Space Force University Partnership in um, the Workforce pipe, Pipeline as a model that could be uh, utilized here. So the report that Comstex prepared for this includes an appendix with a list of resources that can serve as a start for this aggregation of opportunities for the FAA in terms of internship programs, scholarships, training programs, industry DEI initiatives, academic outreach programs, job postings and workforce programs. Um, this is sort of a starting point for which uh, one of these portals could be uh, developed. So I'd like to know if we have a couple of questions here. If we can go to Captain DePete. Sure, yes. Nice job on this. This is really great. Uh, was really into this one. I was the first president at ALPA to form a diversity and inclusion committee and, and a STEM initiative. And um, so, you know, pretty familiar with this. Um, you know, we formed about 13 different LOAs too with different universities where we provide mentorship for students, you know, that are interested in any kind of aerospace jobs, not just piloting jobs. But um, I wanted to ask, you know, on the high school, uh, mention, mention the high school and universities, we actually started working even at the small grammar school level because of, you know, what we know about brain development and wiring and all that kind of thing. And I, I'm just curious if we want to add something like like that in there, but um, you know, so it's it, it's not a you know do or die for me. So we did have middle schools in part of the report, and I'm trying to see if it is here as well. Yeah, like middle schools would be great. 
a lot of the a lot of the work's been done by the time they get to high school. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Uh, John, can I ask you to add middle schools to this uh, top bullet here? So in the previous, particularly in the spaceport um, uh, piece, part of the, the uh, white paper, we talk about K through 12 as well. So we do have some um, earlier uh, education programs uh, mentioned in the white paper, but if we could um, add that here, great. Um, okay, Mike, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Janice. My question is on the second bullet, I read that to say that AST will, as it interacts with middle schools, high schools, et cetera, it is letting them know about or, or connecting them to DOL's program and that AST is not starting its own program. Is, is, that, is that correct? Is that a correct reading? It's, it's uh, supposed to be use of the apprenticeship accelerator model, um, an extension of rather than a recreation of another tool. Um, this is part of the overall th theme of this is not recreate where things already Got exist. It. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Uh, just one thought. I, I uh, don't know whether we touched on this at all in the past, but the, uh, the, the NASA punch program seemed like it would fit in here somehow. Um, you know, the, the punch is there excuse me, high schools united with NASA to create hardware, <coughs> to create hardware. Uh, that's the hunch program that, uh, that enhances STEM and students from middle schools, high schools, universities produce capability that's actually flown up to the space station uh, and used by the astronauts. And uh, it has everything from culinary uh, side of it to actual manufacturing hardware. Uh, that, that goes up to the space station. Seems like that ought to be incorporated in here somewhere and we don't really touch that. Okay, that, I don't see that one already listed within the, the white paper, but it's something we should definitely add. Um, I think it would not necessarily need to be in the top level recommendations if that's okay. Yeah, I just think it'll be folded in here with some of the, the other initiatives or, or recommendations somewhere because it's a very active program that gets right up to what we're talking about. And it's a national program. Do, do you have a, a recommendation on where it should be put within these slides then? Uh, I think with this middle school, high schools, universities and students. So um, a separate bullet? Yeah, I would. you know, develop a, a, a direct relationship uh, with the lunch program to, you know, enhance uh, middle, high school and universities, STEM engagement. Um, okay, let's try and get John some text here. So I think there was a question of when we were incorporating all of these different programs, which ones we wanted to call out specifically because NASA has quite a few um, particularly middle school, high school uh, programs for students. Um, I think when we created the high level recommendation here, we were focused really because uh, the Department of Labor Space Focus Ac Apprenticeship Accelerator and Space Force Partnership were very much focused on um, direct skill development um, in terms of uh, you know, the apprenticeship or uh, you know, effectively internship programs that fed directly into the pipeline um, versus all of these K-12 education programs, which we did put in the appendix. So I think there's a question of, I mean, how many things do we call out if they're not specific to developing the exact skills needed for the space workforce? Well, my, I would submit that out of all those programs, uh, how many uh, actually build, develop, or prepare uh, capability that's actually flown to the space station for use by the astronaut. And, and it crosses middle school, high school, and universities. And I would just ask, how many of those other programs do that? 
I would submit probably none of them. Okay. I'm agreeing with Therese in that I do think that there's the right place for this in the appendix as a place to put the program um, because it is not directly tied to job skills necessarily that um, would be um, uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure I follow you there because this is this is uh, engineering work um, that that these students do under the under the direct supervision of NASA engineers. Do you know if that's tied into the Workforce Coalition already? I don't know that. Because we do already have in here essentially to to work with NASA as one of the um, members of the National Space Council to um, coordinate their efforts on the Skill Workforce Coalition. And I'm just wondering if that's included. Um, let's go to some of the other questions and come back to it. Uh, Jay. Hey, thank you. Um, I wanted to <clears throat> be a little more specific on the second part of the uh, the second bullet there, where, where we say this pipeline should emphasize the employment of historically excluded communities. I wonder if there's uh, both of these recommendations are very sort of people who want to increase diversity to uh, students. I wonder if there's a way to get feedback from students to sort of understand uh, training gaps or um, exposure or, or the lack thereof, especially when it comes to uh, historically exclu excluded communities. Um, you know, my understanding is that they might not have exposure to even you know physics or some something something very basic at, even at the high school level. Um, to even begin to understand what it what space is. Um, so we want to be more inclusive. I wonder if there's a way to identify gaps and um, work with these uh, schools and organizations to uh, help help them bridge those gaps. So the recommendation could be uh, work with middle schools, high schools, universities, et cetera, to understand gap areas uh, that you know, stand as barriers to entry for uh, um, I agree with you here. And I actually think this is a, a huge focus of what the Space Council is doing. And this is again, why we don't want to, we want to remain tied to what they're doing so that we're not duplicating their efforts and we can just strengthen it, especially as, as uh, the FAA and DOT are part of that. Um, so I think that's satisfied within the, the Space Council's efforts. Um, and that's why also, you know, as as diversity is part of the the task itself, why we want to focus on that. Focus on what? Focus on the, the Space Council's efforts, which are tied into diversity and STEM. Okay. I'm ready to move on to Amanda? Um, just quickly, I think we could go down a rabbit hole if we try to enumerate all the different projects and all the different activities that are going on. Um, and EA, um, putting it in an appendix is appropriate, but maybe here in the recommendation, it is just to uh, enumerate and investigate all the different activities because adding more doesn't help because then you just have conflict, but to leverage what is already existing uh, to some extent rather than adding something new. So my suggestion might be, and if, if it's in the, uh, the white paper, that's great, but to say, investigate the current activities along uh, the, these efforts. 
I, I think you hit it right on the head and and what the recommendations are really geared towards is having the FAA be an aggregator and a portal of this information, not to create new programs, but to be able to communicate those programs in both directions from industry to education, from in education to industry and coordinate that with the other government agencies. So I think that's already included in the okay. way that we've worded this. That and I shall lower my hand. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I want to go back to General Mercer's comments um, and look at this a, a, one more time in terms of uh, the blast or the um, the hunt program. Um, so we definitely don't have that one in the the. Um, the white paper right now. Uh, the question is whether or not that one is something that the FAA could extend as we're talking about with the Department of Labor's program. Now, I'm not sure it would necessarily be appropriate for the FAA to directly participate in those beyond what they're already doing from the licensing side. General Mercer, do you have a, a, a stronger thought on that? I think I think what I'm I'm trying to get at is as we're providing recommendations for the FAA to engage uh, in strengthening these partnerships and these relationships. Uh, I think that is one, particularly where it comes to direct STEM engagement. That is one that is already existing, uh, that NASA already uh, funds and supports, uh, but that is not uh, well known. It's not a well known program. It's certainly not. Uh, well known in the underprivileged, uh, you know, areas, and there are people even within NASA that doesn't know that it exists. Um, when I discussed it with my with the NASA colleagues up at uh, Wallops Island, Virginia, they had never heard of the program. So that's what I'm getting at: is let's embrace it. It exists. Let's use it. Okay, so if we can go back to page one, um, John or to recommendation one. Now this is tying into National Space Council agencies. If this is the right place to add it, this is where I would add it in the white, in the white paper um, in terms of coordination with a National Space Council agency uh, and one of their existing programs. Does that make sense for you? Yes, it could fit, it could fit here, yeah. yeah. Um, because this way they would be coordinating with the central part of NASA to um, look at how they may participate any further in that program. Yep. And we'll make sure that it's included in the appendix as well. Awesome, thank you. Okay. So some edits to the white paper before that. Uh, gets turned over. Um, I saw some hands up and come down. Are there any other questions on this? No, Janice, you just addressed what I was going to say. Okay, thanks, Kate. Thank um, and Kate has spent a lot of time working with um, Quincy at the National Space Council on how best to coordinate between that staff and these. So are we ready? Oh, Mike, go ahead. I move to, to vote on the two recommendations. Three sets of them. Second. Okay. Do you want to do the roll call on them? Yeah. Yep. yeah if there's no other discussion, we could definitely take a roll call vote. All right. I'm going to do it in alphabetical for real this time. Uh, General Bolton. Yes. Uh, Captain Pete. Yes. Uh, Trent Dries. Yes. Matt Dunn. Yes. Uh, John Elvin, Elbon, sorry. Yes. Uh, Tony Frigo. Yes. I'm a yes. Um, absent. Therese Jones. Yes. Uh, Tail Ketchum. Yes. Kate Cron Miller. Yes. Uh, General Mercer. Yes. Uh, Megan Mitchell. Yes. Mike Moses. Yes. 
George Neal. Yes. Melanie Presser. Karen Schoenwerk. Yes. Amanda Simpson. Yes. Uh, Ganesh Sitaram. Yes. Jay Skylas. Yes. Uh, Janice? Yes. What do you think? Okay. Uh, Melanie Strickland. Yes. Julie Zoller. Yes. Uh, Ann Zolkowski. Yes. All right, the yes is carried. Did I miss anyone who I who may have joined since our last roll call? I'll pause for a second. Okay. Uh, Thanks, everyone. The yeses have it, Karina. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janice. Really appreciate you seeing all this through and taking all these comments into consideration. I think we're moving on to the safety working group. Uh, I think that's the next one. If I will hand it over to Mike Moses. Okay. Thanks, Karina. Uh, and let's see, we're going to cover some topics which are going to kind of be throwbacks to what we talked about uh, both in the morning session and when we were talking about the draft report to Congress. So first off, uh, I'll introduce the folks on the safety working group the, with me. Uh, Dr. Michelle Parker is our co-chair, uh, John Elbin, uh, Joe DePete, Matt Dunn, Tony Frego, and Melanie Strickland, uh, along with myself, are in the safety working group. And I just wanted to thank everybody uh, on that group for their time and their support developing and reviewing these recommendations, including some last minute stuff uh, over the last few weeks as we scrambled to get here. Uh, there's a few of us that also have staff members supporting us. Uh, and I wanted to make sure we give a big shout out to them as well. I, I, I'm not great at making charts, but uh, I have staff that help a lot with that. So thank you to everybody who's done that. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, these were the two questions that were asked uh, that we then passed off to the safety working group. And, and simplistically, the first one is how do you measure the implementation of voluntary consensus standards. We talked this morning uh, a little bit about uh, with Rand as to the, the difficulties they said they faced uh, with that measurement. And then the second one is a little more uh, bigger picture to uh, not just development of standards, but how those standards could become a means of compliance as you move into future performance-based uh, safety regulatory framework and requirements. Uh, and so we'll go through the slides. There's some recommendations. I believe both of these are ready for a vote based on our recommendations. However, that second one, I think we'll recommend that we, we continue some carryover work uh, into the next ComStack session uh, to further, further explore. So for background, I don't think I need to go through all this. I'll, I'll let folks read it while I'm talking. We've separately hit this background several times today. I think the, the most important thing there to note is my takeaway is we should acknowledge, right, industry is, is currently building very safe, very complex systems to take humans to space. Um, while it might be hard to measure progress directly, results are showing uh, that those systems are very complex and operating safely, uh, certainly within the mandate to public safety, uh, if not also occupant safety, uh, as we go forward. So I won't I won't spare more, any more time on the background. So if we go next page, you can go, folks, so recommendation one more, one more page. So here were our observations from that first task. Uh, basically, uh, the industry is continuing to contribute time and effort to developing these standards. And, and we attempted to try to address why we weren't maybe seeing as progress uh, progress as, as fast as others might think or we would like. And, and we boiled it down to a few things. Um, there is very limited crude flight data. Um, you know, there, as we stated earlier, there are three providers currently flying very disparate systems, right? So there's a suborbital space plane with pilots on board that's air launched. There's a suborbital capsule uh, that is fully autonomous, and there's an orbital capsule that's carrying both NASA government astronauts as well as commercial uh, spaceflight participants uh, in both a piloted and an autonomous version. Um, some of them have integrated launch vehicles, as we talked about earlier today. Uh, the launch vehicle is very much tied to the human spaceflight system. Um, and I'll just speak for my own, right? My own system is tied together. The launch vehicle is the spaceflight system for human spaceflight. So they are uh, combined. There's not a separate booster system. So those uh, are very limited amount of data uh, and, and commonalities that kind of covers the first two bullets there, commonalities uh, of the diverse operations. Now, there are, there are things that are similar, and I think that's reflected in the standards work that is occurring. 
uh, occupant restraint systems, environmental control uh, and life support system commonality, basic system design, redundancy factors, environmental conditions that affect uh, the capsule and the cabins. Those are all fairly common and we're seeing common standards work in those areas. Uh, there are certainly competing demands on company resources and I think the, the fourth bullet applies too. Uh, specifically, if you look back in, we were talking about the 2014 period where those first recommended practices were occurring. I think at that time it was pretty wishful thinking uh, that NASA would have a commercial crew type program that is as successful as it is today. Uh, but now that it's here, it, it does throw a little bit of a curveball in things. Uh, if you're a, a business that has limited resources and you have a contractual requirement from NASA to meet requirements, right? you're probably spending your limited resources on those requirements as opposed to helping turn those requirements into standards that others can use as well. And so I'm not using that as an excuse, but I think it should be recognized as a driving factor in, in the standards development uh, efforts that have been occurring. I think the other bullets we talked about already, and, and it was great having uh, Mike L.A. talking about the ASTM F-47 efforts uh, that are occurring right now with safety development organizations. And so I think I'll move to the next slide. So findings from those observations. Obviously, I think the concept of being able to measure uh, how well these standards are being used is extremely important, right? It was a discussion item for today. A little more visibility or access to be able to see a little more obviously would certainly help with the promotion and the understanding of where industry is and where AST is both in a current state as well as it moves into future rulemaking. So obviously measuring is an important thing to do. Along the way, we should also be evaluating their effectiveness, right? So as we are adding standards, are they really helping address safety? And we're seeing how well those achieve the interest in protecting both the public and the occupant safety. Um, as new technologies come on board, right, those standards may or may not directly apply. It would be great to be able to have a survey that gets feedback on that process as well. And you certainly want to flag uh, anywhere the duplication of effort with any other activities, requirements or government standards that are being levied uh, so you can help av avoid duplication of effort and reduce the burden uh, on both the U.S. government and the industry to go. Uh, so that, and I think the last set of bullets talk about the, the again, the degree by which you want to collect feedback, not just on whether they're being used, but how they are, how hard it was to make them to get consensus. I think as we move forward, if you keep standardized, uh, standard standards as a method of uh, compliance, or at least alternate means of compliance, it'd be great to make sure you get data on that. So as we move into recommendations, it was pretty easy for the safety working to agree. Measuring this is, a, is an important task. So we go to the next page. So our recommendation is, John, if you could fast forward one more slide. There you go. Thank you. Uh, that a voluntary survey to assess the implementation of developed standards is important and should be conducted by the FAA. However, in line with the discussions we've been having, when you go do this survey uh, is an important question. And so uh, I think after more are, are developed uh, would certainly be easier. Right now, you'd be surveying a very small group of providers against a small subset of human spaceflight safety standards. So you might want to factor that in as to when you do this survey. And when you do it, you should certainly capture existing licensed operations, as well as put a mechanism in place in the license approval process to gather this data up front, rather than having to go back and resurvey regularly. Uh, so we, we recommend basically that you should conduct the survey after working with industry to make sure we have uh, a, a set of high priority human spaceflight standards deployed. Uh, but if you want to go before that, the, the final recommendation basically says, make sure you address this, this dichotomy of contractually required government standards and any other practices being used. I think it is a process that was not, uh, again, well considered as a future back in the early days of development of the voluntary safety standards issues. So those are the, the recommendations on task one. I was going to hold off to vote until the end, but let's open it up for discussions before we move on to the second thing. And uh, General Mercer, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, just uh, on the uh, on the survey, there, there are, there's a, a little different approach that you might take on the surveys. Uh, it's called uh, sentiment analysis, uh, that you can get uh, real-time survey capability without the standard survey approach. Uh, and uh, there is, I know there's an office in the FAA that that, that does sentiment analysis for, 
portions of the FAA, but that's kind of where surveys are going now. Uh, and uh, it, much, much faster, much more accurate. And in, indeed, you get your feedback almost real time. Um, so I just wanted to plant that seed there. And I think I think there is uh, in in the FAA, the uh, next gen office, I think, has got uh, an expert in sentiment analysis that they've done for the agency in places. That's a great observation. Thank you. And, and I should offer to anybody, uh, I, I don't want to be the only voice speaking for the safety working group. So anybody from the, the working group, feel free to chime in at any time uh, and make your own comments or observations or, or, or help prompt questions and conversations with the uh, larger com stack. Okay, Megan. Hey, Mike. Um, great recommendations and thanks for you know the work that your uh, that your working group did. Um, I just wanted to ask on this task or on the recommendations when you say um, like assessing the implementation of developed vol voluntary consensus standards. Can you elaborate on uh, the word implementation um, could get interpreted different ways. So I didn't know if you wanted to clarify or, or I can elaborate on, on my thoughts in terms of making sure it's not too strict. Yeah, I could I could paraphrase the input you gave us and I think your words are better. So why don't that you go ahead and say it. I do I do mean a little different than just straight implementation. So yeah, why don't you go ahead? And <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically we view it as um, an assessment against the standards content, right? Such that we can say, um, if we think about a performance-based framework, right, right, there's a little amount of tailoring for applicability for any company. So when we say implementation, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that like directly in our documents, it says this standard is being met, et cetera, like, that we can prove we are meeting the intent of that standard. But depending on how a standard is drafted, right, that, that a company's way of meeting it, the means of compliance to meeting that standard could vary slightly from company to company, right? I think that's what we're hoping for. Yeah, that is that is exactly, I think, uh, that is a better interpretation of the word implementation. It's and, and I think back to the, it's not just are you doing it or not, it's the how, why is it maybe not quite right, why doesn't it quite apply? That's the value, I think, for AST is to gain and, and the standard development organizations as well. That'll help influence how future standards get written to make them more applicable and, and broader, for yep. sure. Thanks. Okay, well, we can certainly come back to more discussion on number one because number two is a very uh, uh, immediate draft after number one, which is to talk about how the FAA can go encourage the development of consensus standards as a means of compliance for performance-based safety requirements. So if we go to the next page, uh, from an observation, I think it's pretty straightforward to say that, right, um, the FAA and Comstack both have, have long recognized the, the development of these standards and how they can apply. Uh, in fact, uh, the last bullet basically summarizes that the FAA itself definitely has a, a history of utilizing voluntary safety standards. One of the things that we're not making a recommendation, but in the vein of we want to at Safety Working Group continue this discussion into the next session would be to go explore and gather more data and get some reports on some of those other methods. For example, uh, there is a light sport aircraft approach that the FAA used several years ago, uh, kind of similar that used a standards-based compliance as a means of certification in a very limited number of vehicles with limited applications. So I'm not saying that human spaceflight falls into that same category as light support aircraft, light sport aircraft, but it was a concept of a means to use standards versus heavy uh, prescriptive regulations. And we'd love to be able to talk deeper with the, the people at the FAA and in industry who helped create that, that change. That would be a great thing to do. The other area which uh, Captain DePeat brought up as, as a great one is the AQP program, which is an advanced qualification program which provides uh, part 121 and 135 operators with an alternate means to show compliance for training and requirements for crew and ground operations personnel. Um, and again, while not vehicle design, it's a great example, I think, of where you can hand the baton off to an industry uh, to show means to a set of approved standards uh, that can then turn into regulatory compliance. So I think that one's worth uh, worthy of further discussion as well as we move forward. We go to the next page. So the findings from that, uh, basically, 
uh, we talked a little bit this morning. The Rand report also showed, and and Mike Lake talked about there was a history here of of a lot of different organizations uh, working on standards. We've pretty much got ourselves to the point where ASTM F forty seven seems to be the predominant thing, and our recommendation will be to continue to support uh, driving into a single uh, active industry standards organization. The second bullet is we want to increase the FA's participation in that. Uh, we talked a little bit about initially they were not uh, much of a part of it. They have now gotten very involved. Specifically, we're going to recommend that they help into the steering of what comes next, as, as well as the crafting of where those regulations might go. We'll get to that when we get to the recommendations page. Um, the other thing the FAA can do for us is to help provide guidance on how it would plan to use that as a means of compliance. And again, we're a little bit in the chicken and the egg thing, right? Is, hey, industry, tell us how to use standards to help comply but we need the FAA to tell us how they think they want to go about it. Again, kind of similar to everything else, a roadmap is going to be really important to help align everybody to a common goal so that standards are written as a means to potentially be future compliance, as well as future regulations are written in a way that can incorporate standards as a means of compliance. So you have to kind of do both and you kind of have to do them at the same time. So that's going to be one of our recommendations. Uh, and then I think I won't bother to read all of the text on this chart. I don't, I think we packed in as many words as we possibly could in the square footage we had available on this on this chart. Um, but again, back to the the other pieces of the uh, of the survey too is right. Look where we're duplicating where are contractually required obligations helping drive things and really try to account for some diverse types of systems as you go about looking at standards. So next page, uh, we have two pages of recommendations. Uh, so I'll cover the first one right here. Uh, we recommend the FA focuses uh, on ASTM 47 in three main areas, guide, support, and assess. So under guide, uh, we'd like to see a more active role in the committee that plans strategic road mapping, which standards are next up, uh, and which companies are going to help develop and take the lead in authoring. And I think there the key is that the FAA really can bring in its common knowledge of various operator safety frameworks and recommend areas where they see high commonality, right? Industry can get together and talk about it, but the FAA has a lot of data there as well that we'd like to see them bring to the table a little more than they have been in the past. Uh, and again, it's going to take some resources to do so. We've already talked about the resource constraints that AST is under. And I think all of us are supportive of, of trying to increase those resources as, as best we can. Um, but that the other area there is, speaking of resources, industry might be able to bring to bear skill sets that the AST doesn't currently have as they talk about rulemaking um, and other potential standards development. So bolstering gaps in expertise, let's leverage the rulemaking groups to help bring that expertise to bear. So that's help guide in help developed, uh, right? Again, FAA should continue to give a, a roadmap uh, for what is coming up next and help participate in the balloting process. We have one uh, up for ballot just today. Uh, which is guidelines on suborbital medical standards for occupants. Uh, and that's a great one where the FAA has been participating in the balloting process. And to assess standards, basically back to the survey in, in tasker number one, uh, look at the completeness of those standards as they serve to mean uh, a means of compliance and give some guidance on how that might be road mapping into future rulemaking. Next page. Uh, I think we've covered this several times now, is there is an upcoming update to the recommended practices for human spaceflight occupant safety. Uh, make sure you involve Comstack and industry in that review. I think that's a, a done deal. That's going to happen. Um, and then this is the part where the, the safety working group would like to continue to review the recommendation here as to how we could do this, including exploring other uh, methods that the, that the industry has been using and the FAA has been using where standards help comply uh, to potential rulemaking. So that's the uh, the summary. Let me pause for discussion on tasker number two. If you want to go back one page, that's probably the bigger meat of the, yep, the recommendations for task number two. So I'll pause for discussions here. Okay, so Karina, with that and Mike, uh, we basically are recommending for task one, uh, a vote on the recommendations being proposed on how to go about measuring. I think, uh, you know, with General Mercer's comments, we can roll that into how AST would go actually implement a survey or a, um, uh, a sentiment analysis. I think that's a great idea, in, in, but that goes down into the how you go about doing it. So I think the recommendation 
uh, is probably good as written. And then for task two, the recommendation is basically adopting here on this page that's being shown. Uh, I think the recommendations on the second page were already covered uh, in other, other approvals. Uh, and then this is one we would say, while we're ready to vote on these recommendations, we'd like to continue to work on this one uh, in the future. Uh, and we can talk with, uh, with Jim and the AST folks if they wanna make this a task for the next session for us. Okay, I think that's reasonable. Does anybody have any other discussion here? Uh, if not, I'll call for a motion. No move. Second. Excellent. Uh, Mike, are you available to do roll call? I am. I'm hoping to improve over time. Uh, we'll go with uh, General, Bol General Bolton. I vote yes. All right, Captain DePete. Yes, I moved. I say yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Karina Dries? Yes. Matt Dunn? Yes. John Elbon? Elbon? I can't. I keep doing that. Either one works. Yes. <laughs> Tony Frigo? Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Therese Jones? Yes. Dale Ketchum? Yes. Kate Cronmiller? Yes. General Mercer? Yes. Megan Mitchell? Yes. Mike Moses? Yes. Uh, George Neal? Yes. Uh, Melanie uh, uh, Priester joined back. Uh, uh, Karen moved. Uh, Amanda Simpson? Yes. Ganesh Sita Raman? Yes. Jay Skylas? Yes. Janice Starzik? Yes. Melanie Strickland? Yes. Julie Zoller? Yes. Ann Zolkowski? Yes. All right. Uh, yes, have it again. Carissa, Karina, I'll turn it back to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and thanks, Mike Moses, uh, for your leadership on this. And I know it's been kind of a heavy lift getting through that. So really appreciate the work you and your work you have done on this. Um, I'm, my personal preference is to push through. Uh, I suppose the folks like feel very strongly we need a five minute break. Um, I guess I'm thinking like, if you need a break, go ahead and take a break and come back uh, because we've got two more tasks to go through and we have a tentative end time at four o'clock. So I'm hoping everyone's okay with us pushing through and I think we're on to the Innovation Infrastructure Working Group task as the next one. If I've, yeah, I think I've got everything in order here. And I will turn it over, I think, to General Bolton. I don't know if Melanie was uh, going to co-host with you, but General Bolton, take it away. Uh, I, I believe she's going to co-host. Let, let, let me just say uh, thank you, uh, Corinna and Mike. And following the example we just saw, could I ask that the last slide be put up first before we go back to these slides? The slide, the team's, team's names on it. That last slide, second last slide, last slide. Yeah, it's at the end of this. Uh, yeah, they stop right, right there. Uh, I, I also uh, want to uh, follow suit and recognize the team. Uh, if you look at this team, you've, you've got over a hundred years, well over a hundred years of experience. Uh, and that's probably just me and George. Uh, and the, these, these folks have, uh, <laughs> I put myself in there with you, George. Uh, we're about the same age. Uh, and so I, I want to call this piece. This is this is not a study, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, like Tom, General Tom Mormon once famously said that the world is two thirds covered with water and one third covered with launch and range studies. Uh, so, and, and you've heard several today. This is not that. This is a op-ed uh, based upon my discussions with Kelvin, and uh, consistent with what Billy Nolan said is that this is a, a thought piece. An op-ed is. This, here is what the FA should be thinking about, should be anticipating the future and what, what they should be worried about. Uh, and so if you will go back to the overview slide, here's the talk, topics we'll cover. I'll kick it over to Melanie Pressler, who is a EVP at your stake systems and the co-chair for this work. She's gonna walk you through the, the slides.
I, I don't think we have Melanie on just because she was not on just re, just on that last vote. Uh, so let me walk through the slides. Uh, and this, these are the four areas that we're gonna that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, first, we'll we'll review the uh, innovation infrastructure working group task. Uh, and that task, uh, I, I shaped that, we shaped that with uh, very recently with Kelvin. So we think that's what they're interested in and talk about our responses and observations, finding some recommendations. I've already briefed the infrastructure and working group members. So next slide, please. Uh, so our tasks, I'll, I'll spend more time on the tasks and less, less time on, on the thoughts to make sure you, you understood what we're thinking about is that, uh, you know, how can the current approach to fight authorization and decision to proceed to a decision process to adjudicate access to government provided ranges be modified to better facilitate launch operations uh, and launch range operations. You know, we, we heard it uh, from the uh, acting administrator, we heard it from uh, our two star, soon to be three star, star general, is that where the launch and range, their ops tempo is, is increasing rapidly and we need to adjust. We can't, we will not be able to accommodate this ops tempo if we keep on doing things the same way we've been doing it. And we want to try to level the playing field, or at least give the give some of the newer entrants, uh, the most credible newer entrants, an opportunity to, to support the transition to space force. And so we, in this briefing, provide information and perspectives on, on ongoing materials and resource-related issues that are negatively impacting launch operations. Uh, and then we also uh, have a views on if these issues are negatively impacting time launch ops re-entry licensing and economic development. And we have a few thoughts on the Im impacts and implications. And then finally, we do have specific recommendations the working group provides on to the FAA to address these concerns and mitigate risks associated with the current oversight approaches and the issues the team identified. Um, and so uh, our chairwoman did say to make sure that the, that the working group was involved in this work. This is their work. We, we, circulated uh, these uh, questions, uh, got uh, direct, written, detailed, uh, multi-page feedback from each person, uh, and then we boiled that down in. And so uh, if, as we go through these slides, if there's a person that says, oh, I, I wrote that comment, I wanna, I wanna elucidate further on it, or I wanna expand on it, or if there's a question uh, that someone has, you get an opportunity to send it. Next slide. So uh, the observations, what do I think? Oh, Mel Melody has tech difficulties. If she, if, she, if she comes back in, she'll, she'll let us know and, and she can take over at any point. But uh, she, she's with us in spirit because uh, she's texting me in real time. Uh, our observations, uh, flight authorization, decision processes for government provided range services. So it is our considered view that state and private spaceports should have more access to government provided range supplies and services and the opportunity to participate in regularly, regular coordination re regarding national spaceport strategy planning or operations. Um, federal, oh, I forgot to say that uh, this, this uh, presentation is very consistent with the spaceport uh, working group work that you saw earlier. We did have an opportunity to, to, to review that uh, in advance. And some of us are actually actually involved in that work. So, um, you know, maybe next time, you know, this, this actually is kind of harkening back to earlier conversations. So it should be very consistent with what the uh, uh, Pam Underwood and, uh, and uh, Steve uh, said that the government is heading towards. So um, we think that the U.S. government is doing a, a fair to good job of improvising and adapting to commercial needs, but there is a limit to their uh, efficacy, uh, how effective they are and how efficient they are. And you did remember the conversation we had earlier, and a lot of it is about manpower. And so the provision of commodities and services, the state and private spaceports, they're not core to the mission. I'm still kidding. Okay, uh, I'm gonna finish out this slide uh, the USG regulatory approvals can delay the first mission of new vehicles coming to the launch ranges. This includes coordinating launch licenses, meeting range safety requirements and exit, which can take months. And now I'll kick it over to our, to our uh, co-chair, uh, Melanie Presser. Next slide, please. Hey, General Bolton, everybody. So sorry, I was having technical difficulties. Um, so as General Bolton was saying, 
Um, you know, we, we had a lot of discussion earlier today from folks like Pam Underwood and Dan Murray and also General Purdy about um, resources being an issue. Well, uh, one, of the th one of the observations that we highlighted from our um, kind of investigation is, hey, there currently is no federal program to provide funding for space-related infrastructure, such as non-federal sp spaceports. General Purdy did mention that there was funding uh, for federal spaceport uh, infrastructure uh, that got um, uh, uh, enacted uh, in the budget um, recently, but not for non-federal. Um, and so being beholden to limited government provided launch infrastructure is becoming a bottleneck, um, as we heard earlier. And the number of private launch service providers today is saturating, saturating the capability and the capacity of government provided launch infrastructures. General Purdy talked about that quite a bit. Um, we don't think that this uh, resource constraint is gonna go away. Um, in fact, as private space transportation capabilities mature, and as the launch rates continue to increase, there's gonna be um, corresponding and additional pressure on um, commodity supply, production throughput, and timely availability of resources. And we also touched on the fact that workforce demand um, of second and third and fourth tier suppliers is going to also grow, um, and that's not adequately being addressed either. Go to the next chart, please. Um, so we see that the need for more licensed spaceports in the future is going to necessitate both streamlined licensing processes and additional resources um, in order for the government to provide timely regulatory action. Uh, Dan Murray did talk about um, uh, streamlining the licensing process, and I think we all look forward to seeing how that streamlining uh, goes into the future here. Um, we made an observation that private launch service providers might seek alternative launch bases infrastructure um, as we seek facility construction um, get delayed and commodity shortages adversely affect schedules, which increases cycle times uh, for the, the launch rateness. Um, and finally, I'm sorry, was there a, was there a, a comment? Okay. Um, and, um, and federal launch ranges have priority as we've seen in the budget for materials and commodities because they are designated as national assets. Uh, limited access for non-federal ranges and uh, providers can slow the pace of launch uh, for them and their customers. And so this is a potential constraint uh, for spaceport's potential role as critical infrastructure, infrastructure for assured access to space and stronger res resiliency uh, for national security, which is one of uh, the items of consideration that seems to be a topic of the interagency working group that Pam Underwood briefed out earlier. Next chart, please. And so um, just summarizing, we have a number of findings um, and then uh, recommendations on the next chart. So we did find that short, oops, sorry, <laughs> findings. Um, so the, the cumbersome approval process that we've talked about already um, is impacting non-federal providers more severely because they don't have priority um, at federal ranges. Um, it's possible uh, this was an idea brought up by the working group that designating non-federal ranges as critical launch infrastructure could level the playing field and provide additional launch capability for the nation. Um, the government might consider that decreasing reliance of non-federal ranges on the U.S. government might improve efficiency and efficacy of launch capabilities in the U.S. And then finally, um, state and private spaceports have limited opportunity to participate in regular co coordination regarding spaceport strategy. Um, although uh, Pam did say that there was an upcoming opportunity to get involved in an industry um, uh, working group, um, I think she said in June of this year. Next chart. And so moving quickly to the recommendations, um, we have four here. The first is, um, although we appreciated the update today from AST, on streamlining, streamlining, streamlining licensing efforts, um, we do ask for continued updates 
um, on streamlining, streamlining licensing, range safety approvals, and other processes. Um, we'd love to have an additional briefing on the National Spaceport's interagency working groups uh, efforts and, and we'd ask that they solicit, it, solicit state and private spaceport participation and feedback. Um, we also understand that the Space Force has a federal range of supply chain study uh, underway and uh, we would ask for a briefing on that effort from the Space Force. And then finally, uh, given the resource challenges experienced by um, uh, spaceport infrastructure, uh, we recommend that AST brief the National Space Council on launch infrastructure and facility construction delays and commodity shortages uh, in hopes that those be considered for additional um, initiatives and budget. Um, that is the last of the charts. Any comments or questions about the findings and recommendations? And, and let me ask, uh, first of all, great job. Uh, there's nothing like getting kicked off of Zoom right when you're getting ready to brief. <laughs> you know? so, all right. I, I, I really got to commend you because I would have been so rattled. I probably, you probably wouldn't have seen me to the next meeting. So, <laughs> so you handled that very well. Uh, I, I would like to give the team uh, an opportunity because we did most of this online. We didn't do a lot of meetings. If there's anyone in the team that has some strong uh, or, or even mild comments that they want to make uh, in support or opposition of, of this final product, I'd, I'd like to give them that opportunity. And then we'll then then, ma'am, you can lead us through any uh, questions or challenges anyone else has. So this is George. Um, great comments. <clears throat> Just wanted to emphasize that uh, Kelvin and uh, Pam uh, are doing a great job and certainly trying to tactfully support the overall uh, budget process and the resources they've been given. But um, obviously they're constrained in, in what they can say and how they can say it. Uh, it's pretty clear to me in, in listening to um, what's going on at the ranges, at the spaceports, with the fact that people are standing in line waiting to get feedback on their license applications. Uh, there's a resource issue here. Um, AST already has the authority to give uh, grants for spaceport infrastructure. It was given by Congress back in the 1990s and uh, just need to make something happen. I appreciate Pam was uh, sounding upbeat about we've got an interagency working group right now, which is wonderful. I heard General Purdy talked about the strategy. That's wonderful. Uh, it's been a year since we first started hearing about this. I, I think this is another example of government needs to really strive to keep pace with industry. And right now we have a need for infrastructure funding at spaceports. So we need to make a request for that through multiple channels, including the department, the Hill and the National Space Council and see if we can get some action going. So, so George, let me let me just say, and I'll, I'll ask General Mercer to say a couple of points. I mean, you two guys are kind of the deans of this business. We've all looked up to you guys uh, for more than a couple of years. Some of you guys maybe actually have been in the FAA and a little bit about being inside it. Uh, so rumor has it that uh, General Mercer raised this issue to the Vice President, uh, uh, Vice President Harris, and that uh, at a subsequent meeting uh, with the National Space Council, it was it, uh, it we were told. Uh, if, if there's an opportunity to pursue this, uh, you know, we, would, we would work with OMB to perhaps pursue some funding. So General Mercer, do you, do you wanna add, uh, do, you, do you wanna, I don't know if you're still on, if you're, if, you know, you're out there running a launch base, so maybe you didn't have time to listen to this. Yes, yeah, it's not a bit. Sorry. Uh, I believe, yeah, I believe General Mercer had to drop and is not able to, to get back on. Yeah, okay. so. Good. Good, then I can quote him. But Corinna, Ka Ka you're at the meeting, all right? Um, yes. Uh, I guess what I would say is. I'm still here. You're definitely. Oh, can go you ahead. hear me? Go ahead, I'm still here. here. Go ahead. I, I can hear you. Uh, General Mercer, do you want to say anything about uh, the comments you made to the vice president? Uh, yes. Uh, I uh, And Karina was in the room. Uh, when uh, when I had this discussion and and I've had follow up discussions with them since 
uh, about the importance of critical infrastructure uh, designation for your, your space force. You know, the, the, the bottom line is that uh, if the nation has says that it needs and must have assured access to space for, uh, for to be able to fight and win the, na the next war and, and, and we say we do, uh, you cannot do that without space ports. And all space ports are not created equal. You know, we've got some 14, 14. I think, space ports out there, but, but they're not all created equal. They have different capabilities uh, that they bring to bear. You really only have four that are the vertical lift that can put, you know, in excess of 3,000 pounds uh, or more uh, into orbit. And those are two on the West Coast, two on the East Coast. And you heard General Purdy kind of reference those uh, a, a little bit earlier today. So, you know, we have 16 sectors that are identified as critical infrastructure. And if you look at all 16 of those sex sectors, there are at least two that I can think of that, that, uh, that are certainly, if they can be considered critical infrastructure, then the nation's uh, vertical lift spaceports should also be considered critical infrastructure. So that, that's my two cents. Um, you know, I've been writing some information to, uh, to the UAE. Um, here I have some information I need to provide to them per uh, General Lyles' request. And so I will, I will do that and follow up with it. But, but that's where my head is on it. Thank you for allowing me to comment. Uh, you're very welcome. So I guess, I guess Jim and Corinna, as you circle back up through the FA, uh, you know, uh, how, how can we help that pursuit would be all would be what we would, we would uh, offer. Uh, any other, any other comments, uh, Dale Ketchum, are you on? Did you have any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm here general. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with the, I, I think there's just a general consensus that uh, particularly given all the money and designations that have been provided over the last couple of years in Washington to infrastructure. Uh, and there's just a, I think most of us feel as though space is not getting its due respect um, as, as it's designated as critical or just showing up in an infrastructure budget. Um, so I, I think all we can do, and this is a part of it, is to just keep flogging away at the uh, bureaucracy writ large and at the Hill um, that if, 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 if the universe that uh, constitutes our economy and national security continues to rely on space as much as we know it does, and if something happens with that, uh, everybody's going to be screaming bloody murder. And we're all we can do at this point is just keep trying to draw attention to that. And we need, you know, obviously, Florida is very busy, uh, but we also recognize the national security interests of the United States are to broaden our national space ports. Um, and and we need that additional redundant capability. So uh, we're we're supportive. Uh, all we can do is just keep bringing it up as much as we can. I think we're all old and cynical enough to know bureaucracies only move when you just beat the tar out of them. So we'll just consider this part of that step. Excellent. Yeah, you. Great. So I guess I would say um, if there's no additional sort of discussion here, or if you want to, if there's other folks that have some comments on the recommendations before we take a vote, Mike Moses. Yeah, I just wanted to say I think this is awesome, uh, awesome work by the by the group, and uh, thank you, uh, Ed, for the work there. Just one comment: I'm totally supportive of the concept in one of the findings about looking to designate state and private ranges as critical launch infrastructure. I would just make the caution, uh, especially as we head into part 440 with maximum probable loss, that designation comes with a bunch of other stuff that somehow makes uh, potentially insurance things and other stuff like that. So if you truly are a private spaceport, uh, we ought to just make sure we're, we're cautious as we go about uh, adding that to critical launch infrastructure for the nation. But I, I totally agree with the reasoning behind why you do it. Just that little asterisk on uh, careful that there's no unintended consequences. Yeah, uh, so so we were warned that uh, if we put this, we were warned, this sounds negative. Uh, we, we, it was mentioned to us that if we put this up there, there could be some pushback along those lines. And, and, I, and I would say, if you were to go and, and, and say, if we had a common understanding of what critical infrastructure was and what that meant and what that, and what that implied specifically by law, I think you, I think there's there's uh, you know four people on the on the team 
uh, you know, I think you get, I think you get four different, five people on the team, but they get five different answers. So what we really want to do is just have the discussion to start, to start moving in a direction of leveling the play and field and providing some funding. And critical infrastructure was a was a way to explain it to senior people uh, and who haven't grown up in this business. And they say, oh, OK, I get it. Uh, and we even had stronger words in, but, but we had to take them out to, uh, to to make people comfortable. We had words in there comparing it to other kinds of, of infrastructure. Uh, so it's really just to have the thinking that this is another category that it's OK to provide the support for. You know, it's it's not it's not a crisp hard fast uh, definition and we did have some discussions that make us they made us soften the language to to where it is yeah Over. and, and you know, this is this is ted here and and i agree with my colleague that 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 there there could be some uh some consequences here that have to be dealt with and that's how i would look at it right is it is it some of these consequences that 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 may pop up that may be detrimental to a private uh, space board have to be dealt with have to be dealt with by law, have to be dealt with by policy, uh, have to be dealt with by congressional action, but have to be dealt with. Because the bottom line is, you, we are pretty limited right now on, on access to space. You know, you, you lose a Vandenberg, you lose a, a Cape, and, and, and the Cape is exposed to hurricane threat every year, May through November. You know, a, a hurricane could limit your ability to get out of the Cape. And of course, there's Mars. You, you lose one of those and, and you're going to feel it in terms of access to space. And, and when we know what we do about what China and, and what Russia are, are doing in space, not what they're planning to do, what they are actually doing in space, um, I think puts a finer point on the fact that, that we better be able to get to space when we need to go. And without a spaceport, you can't do it. It's just that simple. Okay, if you're okay with taking some more questions, Amanda? Yeah, so what I've been hearing over the last, well, several hours is the criticality of what we're talking about here. And these recommendations are about briefing and providing updates, but no time horizon. Should there be a, you know, provide this update by, brief these by, um, just putting some urgency uh, behind getting these updates and then having those updates include some outcomes or some actions. Okay. All right, I see. Ed, uh, General Bolton giving a thumbs up there. Uh, Jay? Hey, I guess I uh, mostly had a question for the working group um, on the first bullet there. Um, from my understanding, uh, and please chime in and correct me, but I, I don't think these sort of private space ports have successfully launched uh, to orbit. And I think, you know, as a commercial provider, I understand a lot of the uh, experience when you actually go to try to launch it at some of these private space ports that are FAA licensed, they tend to lean a lot on the sort of the most nearest range. Um, so if it's on the East Coast, it might go to, you know, NASA or, or, or 45th or something like that and kind of lean on those range requirements. And a lot of these private space ports really don't have infrastructure. They don't have a range. Um, and I know there was some big push for AFTS and other things. And anyways, there's a lot of ambiguity there. And so in um, FAA AST providing updates on efforts to streamline uh, not licensing and range safety approvals, is there like a sort of a recommendation that you can make to uh, clarify sort of what these private spaceports should do in the absence of their own range requirements for range infrastructure? Well, I think I think you need to uh, you need to clarify what 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 spaceports you're talking about, right? Um, you know, private doesn't doesn't qualify it enough. Uh, you know, Mars, the Mid Atlantic region of spaceport, could be qualified as a private spaceport uh, that's uh, that's owned and operated by the Commonwealth of Virginia, but the capability there is a whole lot different 
than uh, than a Mojave, for example. The whole the range requirements are a whole lot different, you know. So you got to try to, I think, put a finer point on exactly what 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 you're what you're getting at, because I I lost that part of the discussion. Yeah. So I mean, I guess uh, is Mars FAA licensed? I, I mean, that's the so. I guess that's sort of a unique situation because it's right next to Wallops, right? But what about, yeah, yeah. you know, yes. the Colorado area is. transport or... Um, Can I jump in? Can I jump in? Because I, I, I think I'm hearing what you're, what you're asking. And I think, and, uh, you know, I think I understand what Joe Mercer's getting at. So um, uh, uh, there are, there are uh, organizations out there that their first launch is a twinkle in their eye, right? Uh, and there and there are organizations uh, that that are not and this this is really comparing you got Vandenberg and Patrick and you got the rest of the world and there are some other people that are that are at, some of them are actually launching uh, General Mercer is actually launching he's going up to once a month I, I'm on his board so he is he is actually launching he's in discussions uh, with uh, classified organizations, so so he is he is a, a actual launch provider. He is does does not get the a similar level of of of, of uh, support, I would say, and opportunities as as Vandenberg and Patrick. And nothing against Vandenberg and Patrick. Uh, General Mercer and I both worked at both, uh, right? So so it's nothing against them. Um, I, I'm I'm more on we're more on the traditional launch side. But what we're trying to do is is for those people that are that are newer entrants into the launch business, and those people who have uh, a credible near-term futures, right? Uh, you know, not 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 me and my and my nephew in the backyard. I'm I'm saying credible near-term futures. Uh, can we do something? Uh, you know, with within the guidelines to make them more viable, particularly if there's an opportunity to get government funding to support that transition. So that's what it is. So. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I'd have to go uh, uh, to uh, to Melania and, and team if it, it would be particularly in, in in light of the last comment. Would it make more sense to crisp up this level? Although I really don't want to pick winners and losers. That's that's the problem. I'm not in that business, right? Uh, which is one reason why we kept it generic, right? We you you know who you are, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? If if right. Uh, uh, but but that that's the intent. That's where we're going. We right there 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 are, there are people that are actually launching. They're not Vandenberg and Patrick, uh, who could use a little bit more support and would really be good. Uh, a final thing, you know, uh, some of us remember, you know, just before I worked for General Mercer, there was a time we were out in the launch business uh, for about eighteen months. Uh, and if you if you look at the percent of our net worth that's transitioning into space and our reliance on space at this time, from particularly from an Intel perspective. That would be de devastating from a national security, uh, um, from a national security perspective. So it's 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 almost a national security imperative uh, to try to take these, uh, let's say near, uh, you know, nearly there or there, but needing more support, getting them into the business. So we'll so we're more resilient. It's really almost a national security perspective. But we didn't want to go through the depth. You know, there's other studies out there. Again, the world's covered with them. It's just a matter of uh, how, how much time you want to spend reading them. Anyway, that, that was the intent. Okay. Uh, Mike, did you have a comment? Uh, just a procedural one. I think that we, uh, I think we cannot, as a Comstack, recommend something to the U.S. Space Force. I think we just have to edit that recommendation to be a recommendation to AST to facilitate a briefing to the Space Force. Um, that was the first thing. Second thing, uh, you know, a lot of stuff we're talking about with regard to critical infrastructure sectors or critical infrastructure destination, uh, designations fall under uh, DHS. And CISA has actually done quite a bit of work to do outreach, outreach to industry, including some very active working groups there. And so uh, happy to, for folks interested, happy to connect them with the CISA team that's uh, very much trying to get space sector input into that effort. So, you know, I want to make sure some of this energy also is being heard by the CISA folks directly. Okay, thanks, Mike. 
Um, so I'm seeing a lot of folks have to drop at four, and it seems Karen is one of those. Unfortunately, she's going to be briefing the 450 task here next. So um, I might suggest that we just delay the 450 conversation uh, for the next one and see if we can focus on this one. Are we ready to take a vote on these recommendations? Do you feel that they need to be modified or based on the, the comments, General Bolton, do you feel like you're ready to take a vote on these? Uh, Melody? I wanted to consider um, Mike Moses's and Mike French's comments about critical infrastructure. You know, we deliberately did not include that as a recommendation, although it's in our findings chart. Do we need to add something like um, uh, open up the conversation um, about critical infrastructure by um, getting involved with this? CISA effort that Mike French recommended? Uh, I, I like think we should leave it off the recommendations. I don't think there's agreement on that. Oh, not, not agreement. Okay. Correct. I think what he's saying is don't put it in the recommendations because there's not agreement within the comp stack and you don't mm -hmm. currently have it in the recommendations. I think the question is, in your write-up, should it be? Should we maybe um, put some additional language around there, like more information? Uh, the ComSec would be interested in more information about critical infrastructure or something along those lines. But I think the recommendations that you have listed here, I think, are okay, right? And just, I just want to really clarify: I am not advocating whether something should be designated a critical infrastructure sector or not under CISA. Just that that work is happening. Yeah. Right. You got that. Yes. Uh, I, uh, if, if the co-chair and team are okay, I, I'm okay as written. We can make Mike, Mike French's change to bullet three, just say FAA requests the Space Force to breathe or something, but yes. I'm also fine with any, you know, I'm not sure what the exact word would be to, to make it, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, more uh, or, or a sense of urgency or put time or something like that on there. I, you know, that's, that's my natural proclivity anyway. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to actually get it agreed with. So we'll, we'll see. I'm sure it can be improved, but in the spirit of keeping things going, uh, I think this is pretty close. So. I agree. So does anybody want to make a motion? This Dale, I'll move. I'll second. Okay. Uh, could we do a roll call, Mike? Uh, General Bolton? I concur. Uh, Captain Pete? Yes. Karina? Yes. Matt Dunn? Yes. Uh, John Albon? Yes. Uh, Frigo? Yes. I, I'm yes. Uh, Therese Jones? Yes. Dale Ketchum? Yes. Kate Cromiller, General Mercer. Yes. Megan Mitchell. Yes. Mike Moses. Yes. George Neal. Yes. Uh, Melanie Prather. Yes. Yes. Uh, Karen, I think you seconded. Amanda Simpson. Yes. I think maybe Ganesh dropped Ganesh. Jay Skylis? Yes. Janice Starzik? Yes. Melanie Strickland? Yes. Julie Zoller? I think Julie dropped. Uh, Ann Zolkowski? I think Ann may have dropped as well. Okay. Uh, yes, does have it, Ann? Great. Uh, uh, back to you, Karina. Uh, okay, thanks. So, Jim, uh, I guess I, a question for you, since we didn't get through all the items in the agenda, I think Karen actually already dropped, um, and we kind of need her to brief the next uh, se section here. So, um, we could maybe do an interim meeting in between now and November, if y'all prefer that, um, to close out 450 and any you know remaining issues that we may have determined here. Um, and then uh, work on new tasks for the fall that we'll brief in November. I think that's great. Um, I have one one task to to kind of 
start this. I don't think it's going to be a, a massive task, but just want to get some quick recommendations. Uh, so that might be a great thing. We can work uh, with public notification and everything. We have at least 60 days before we can have another public meeting. Uh, so let's work and, and put something out there and get, get something else scheduled. I think that'd be great. Okay, excellent. Um, was there any public comments, Jim? I saw nothing uh, that, that came in, anybody requesting from the public to speak. Uh, so no, there are no public comments at this time. Okay. Is there anything else you want to cover before we close out? I'm worried that we're going to start losing a lot of people. Just, yeah, if, if John, if you could bring up those closing slides. Just real quick uh, is something to, to, this is just a free brief to the ComSec members. Uh, for several years, we've talked about a lessons learned database completely different than a voluntary safety reporting system. This is a lessons learned database. Um, you know, we talked about it in 2018, ComSec said, ah, not just yet. Next slide, please. So we've talked with, N next slide, John. Thank you. Uh, NTSB made a safety recommendation and we have answered and said, hey, you know, we're, we're willing to try this again. Um, these slides will be available for you, uh, so you'll be able to have more in-depth reading. Uh, but we would like to plan to make this available on our website. Next slide, just a few pieces of information. Back in 2015, AST put together a, an implementation plan all the way to include getting OPM approval on a form for industry to submit information. Uh, this summer, we're looking to update that plan, get it all you know, uh, updated the current current dates. We do not have an OPM form or anything. Uh, and this summer, I want to provide it to you all at Comstack uh, to get your advice and recommendations on implementation, if this is a good idea. Uh, and then if so, winter of 23, implement the lessons learned information system. Next slide, please. Uh, the database would be populated with items from AST, mostly from licensing, maybe inspections, mishap investigations. Uh, and sorry, there's a comma missing there between licensing and inspections. This information would be de-identified and provide broadly applicable lessons learned. Uh, industry would be invited to voluntarily submit their own lessons learned in a manner that protects proprietary information via that OPM form that we're going to work to get approved. Uh, so this is just kind of a, an initial, hey, this is coming your way as a task. This is not, you know, being published out, uh, you know, and implemented, but I wanted to give you all a heads up that this is one of the tasks that will be coming your direction to get your feedback on. Next slide, please. There is a compliance enforcement workshop on the 10th of July, 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, contact ASTO, the, or AST operations, sorry, uh, to get more information. Currently, the next ComStack is scheduled for November 7th and 8th in person, uh, location to be determined, and there will be another ComStack meeting that we'll put on the books, uh, and it will most likely be virtual like this, but a much shorter one. Uh, to clean up anything that, that we need to and get back any information that we can to you all that you've requested. And that's all I have other than, again, thank you. This has been a jam-packed day. I appreciate all the, the conversation, discussion that has been had. So thank you. Karina, back to you. Yep, I'll, that's all I'm going to say is thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for your time and attention. Um, all of your hard work these past few months. I really appreciate it. We'll get back to you soon on when we can realistically set a schedule for an interim meeting to cover 450. And like Jim mentioned, anything else? Um, any Anything else, Mike? Thank you, Karina and, and Jim for, for getting us through the day here. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Thank you. We are, we are adjourned.